Can you do hear me? Yes. Okay, hello, Kenji. Uh, it's uh, one to it's nine thirty. So please let me know whenever you're ready, and I will start the webinar. We are ready. We are ready now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, just a second. So I wish you uh, everyone a uh, good meeting, start the recordings, and I start the webinar. Yes, please. It's done. Thank you. Uh, urgently, please, Mag, make Anna co-host, Anna Lontadze, please. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. Good morning. I hope you all had a good rest after the first day of our second Memory of the World Global Policy Forum. It's good to see you back here today and good to see many of you back with us on our stream. I hope uh, we are all ready for today. Now yesterday was an eventful day and I will stress full because we certainly had a number of presentations that went through the challenges of documentary heritage preservation. We got regional overviews, we got national overviews, and that really laid the foundation for the work that we will do today. Uh, today will be us getting into dialogue, discussing some of the issues, some of the challenges, and talking about the way forward. So I invite you today to join the discussion, either again in the Q&A in our stream, or if you're here in the room by raising your hand and joining our panel discussions that we will have today. Just a few points that we took from day one, points that I took at least, and, and many of them are essential points that will guide our discussion today. We heard about how COVID-19 presented a big challenge for memory institutions. Uh, it restricted physical access to documentary heritage, and those tasks that usually are routine of preserving documentary heritage became actually physically impossible. So emergency preparedness is going to have to be a very important component of disaster risk reduction and management going forward. We also heard about why it is important to start uh, recording and documenting even during a disaster and in the e immediate aftermath, and that documenting a disaster is not the same as remembering it. So how do we increase access and bring documenting, uh, documenting that heritage, anchor it into the collective conscience of our communities? Uh, we heard Mr. Matsuda speak about the unprecedented nature of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, yet more than a century earlier, as he told us, there had been similar devastation. So recording and stringing the thread between many of these incidents can help prepare for the future. We also heard about these competence centers for conservation of cultural heritage, uh, where here in Europe, they were originally focused on monuments and sites. They will now also extend to documentary heritage. So if we talk about best practices, these are perhaps examples that can be shared and learned from. And we also heard about expanding what the definition of a disaster is from Ms. Aparna Tandon, not just a natural disaster, but anything that causes huge disruption and social impact. 
that is worth keeping in mind if you think about the vast array of threats that are faced to documentary heritage and its preservation from COVID-19 to digital threats. You will have picked up many more points that uh, we will bring into our discussion today. I'd like to remind you what we mentioned yesterday, that's the goal to get through uh, today, to move forward a specific action framework for disaster risk reduction and management uh, by focusing on national, regional, and global level implementation. We hope to embolden memory institutions to apply the principles of disaster risk reduction and management of documentary heritage preservation in an interdisciplinary approach and also to embolden policymakers to start putting those steps into place, taking, account, uh, taking into account documentary heritage in their policy making. So today, as I said, is going to be interactive. We're going to have three panels. Um, you'll see our panelists from the first panel already seated here. Uh, we're going to go a bit more granular into some of the issues that we discussed yesterday. And uh, we'll bring in questions towards the end of the panel session. The facilitator for each panel will do so. Uh, again, we look forward to have the opportunity to uh, engage you in our conversation. So that is what we are looking to do today in a very active way. I'd first like to introduce Mr. Faxon Banda, the chief of the Documentary Heritage Unit at UNESCO, who um, spoke yesterday. And he will first uh, take us through a presentation of the Action Framework for Sustainable Preservation of Documentary Heritage. Mr. Banda. Thank you, Sumi, um, and um, um, another special welcome to all of you to our second day, uh, both here in Paris and uh, uh, to all those that are following us uh, on, online. So what I want to do in, in, in a very few minutes is to take you through the strategic framework uh, for UNESCO's action for sustainable preservation of documentary heritage uh, through uh, DRR. This is not a strategy as such, it's a framework. What that means is we are open to have uh, more suggestions. So this is just an outline that I'll give you. Uh, beyond this event, uh, we'll be looking uh, to you to um, uh, populate the framework with uh, many more perspectives. So it will be placed on our website, um, and, and you can continue to inform it uh, with your perspectives, with your experiences. Uh, it will inform our work. It will guide uh, what we will do within the framework of uh, the uh, project supported uh, by Japan. So uh, what I will do then is uh, to uh, very quickly introduce the strategic framework in terms of the Memory of the World program as it uh, exists in a wider uh, context of cultural heritage preservation and accessibility. I will then uh, uh, read out the strategic goal and objectives of this uh, response, um, after which I will lay out the priority, uh, priority areas of action informed by the Sendai framework for DRR and then I will lay out the implementation and a monitoring uh, system for that. So very quickly then moving on to uh, the uh, Memory of the World program and how it relates to this. It seems to me that uh, DRR is actually built into the programmatic DNA of uh, the Memory of the World program. So for example, when it was set up, uh, the objective was to increase awareness and protection of the world's documentary heritage and provide for its uh, universal and permanent uh, accessibility. Uh, what is important to recognize is that this emerged from uh, uh, the idea that there was, um, um, uh, there was uh, this, uh, this notion of documentary heritage being in a parallel state of preservation and access to documentary heritage in various parts of the world. So war and social upheavals, for example, uh, severe uh, lack of resources, uh, worsened the problems, uh, and largely because of that, uh, there was a danger uh, to uh, documentary heritage, uh, and in particular, as it was seen 
um, uh, uh, as contributing to sustainable development. Uh, and so the idea then of the memoir of the world was to try to capture all this, put it together uh, as, as memory and pass it on. Uh, for if there is a significant and enduring danger uh, to documentary heritage, it is likely uh, to result in, 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 in harm, uh, not only to the memory, but also to the sense of self-identity um, that documentary heritage is, 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 is associated with. More importantly, uh, for the Memory of the World program in 2015, and yesterday we touched on this in, in various uh, instances, the member states adopted the recommendation concerning the preservation of and access to documentary heritage, including in digital form, and it outlines five uh, areas of, uh, of, of intervention, three of which are actually the objectives of the Member of the World program when it was set up, and the other two speak to uh, an enabling environment. Um, when we talk about policy and cooperation, these are more about an enabling environment for identification, preservation, and access to thrive. So putly, uh, putly, uh, uh, simply put, the Memory of the World Program's threefold objective of identifying documentary heritage, promoting its preservation, and enhancing access to it requires an enabling environment of robust policy, as well as national and international cooperation. In 10, the recommendation can be linked to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, and we uh, point to specific uh, SDGs there, SDG 4, um, particularly its reference to quality education, uh, to global citizenship, notions like those uh, require um, a clear sense of, of, of cultural identity. We make reference to SDG uh, 11, uh, which talks about protecting um, natural and, and, um, and, 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 and cultural uh, heritage, and we also uh, rely on SDG, SDG 16, uh, particularly its notion of, uh, uh, of uh, ensuring public access uh, to information and the uh, protection of fundamental freedoms, all of which are caught up uh, in how people see themselves uh, and, and documentary heritage uh, can contribute towards that sense of, uh, of, 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 of cultural worth, if you will. Uh, and in turn, uh, arguably, uh, we could say that uh, um, uh, beyond, uh, beyond the recommendation, beyond the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, we also have uh, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, which uh, for our purposes provides a useful mechanism uh, for discussing possible police actions uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this area, and I think that uh, the uh, presentations yesterday did uh, uh, a marvelous job of uh, unpacking that uh, for us, and I think today we can uh, build on that in terms of concrete actions that we can take within the, frame, uh, within, within the context of this, uh, this framework. Going on then, what is the what is the overall goal of this strategic framework? Well, it is to encourage and support stakeholders' actions for the sustainable preservation of documentary heritage uh, through disaster risk reduction and management, as well as to enhance their capacity to successfully implement the 2015 recommendation and the documentary uh, heritage-related provisions of the Sendai framework. And stakeholders uh, in, in this uh, case would include uh, our member states, uh, memory institutions, both private and, uh, and, and public, international intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, and we have uh, uh, some represented here. So more specifically, uh, one could say that this strategic framework sets out a conceptual and practical framework for enabling stakeholders to take steps to apply the principles of disaster risk reduction and management in their documentary heritage preservation policies uh, from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. What then are the priority areas of action? Taking the cue from the Sendai framework, the first one is to try to understand disaster risk management in relation to documentary heritage. 
Uh, we are appropriating uh, a framework that, that, that refers to cultural heritage, but not necessarily to documentary heritage. And that comes along with its own baggage, especially taking into account that some uh, national um, uh, jurisdictions do not provide for, for documentary heritage as such, uh, but recognize uh, uh, cultural heritage in its, in its um, um, uh, totality. Uh, however, for strategic and practical purposes, we do need uh, to emphasize a documentary heritage, especially in uh, developing countries that are, um, uh, are moving towards uh, adopting uh, legislative frameworks uh, to speak to this particular issue. Uh, so we do need to sign post it as such, and that is why risk management of documentary heritage needs to be part of the general preparedness of societies to avoid and manage threats and disasters caused by climate change, uh, natural catastrophes, uh, armed conflicts, um, as well as other um, uh, um, uh, elements that one may, may identify. Uh, aerial recognition of risks to documentary heritage is essential in this case, in building up capacities to react quickly in the various situations uh, through uh, concerted uh, global actions. Uh, and in, in the document that we've shared with you, we list uh, a few more actions to that effect. Moving on to priority uh, number two, strengthening disaster risk governance for preservation of and accessibility to documentary heritage. There we are recognizing the, the global um, um, architecture uh, that you know, could possibly um, uh, govern uh, documentary heritage in relation to DRR beyond the Sendai framework, hence uh, the reference there to the United Nations Security Council Resolution um, 2347. Um, and then we go on to pick on some specific examples there, creating safe havens for documentary heritage. Blue Shield is here. Uh, they might speak uh, to that, you know, I suppose. Um, so these are some of the actions that we think uh, could help uh, towards building some kind of uh, governance uh, infrastructure. Um, within which documentary heritage could be meaningfully uh, placed. Moving on to uh, um, priority number three there, investing in disaster risk reduction for documentary heritage to enhance resilience. Here, uh, memory institutions uh, are key. Um, uh, because as we know, it's not just the, the documents that they contain which are, 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 are susceptible to, uh, to destruction, to danger. It's also the, the, the memory institutions themselves as, 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 as built heritage. Uh, they are susceptible uh, to, to, uh, to climate change um, and, and, and other um, catastrophes and therefore we do need to have a holistic perspective particularly when we take into account uh, some of the, um, uh, the, the most important groupings uh, in, 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 in UNESCO, small island developing states, uh, uh, least uh, developed uh, 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 developing countries and so on and so forth. Uh, but also uh, linked to that uh, it is important to provide um, uh, a framework within which knowledge, best practices uh, can be shared, uh, certainly uh, bilaterally, but also I think more importantly, multilaterally. Uh, and this is something that I think uh, as UNESCO, we can, uh, we can, we can support uh, stake our stakeholders with. Uh, and linked to that, obviously, as we, we heard um, uh, you know, yesterday, not only from David, but also uh, from, 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 from Harry, um, uh, digital transformation uh, is certainly key to the preservation of documentary heritage. And obviously now, uh, again, throughout the, 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 you know, the day yesterday, we had how key digitization was uh, um, towards, the, uh, towards achieving um, sustainability in as far as uh, documentary heritage uh, is concerned. So that is important to take into account. Moving on then to uh, priority four. Enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response and to build back better in recovery uh, of documentary uh, heritage. 
quite clearly, it's important to preserve uh, valuable data related to natural and human-made disasters in order to ensure its accessibility, particularly uh, for learning. Uh, e.g. satellite related data on climate change, historical records of disasters located in archives, libraries, uh, and so on and so forth. And we heard a little bit more about that uh, yesterday as well. Uh, there are several other points that we list under, uh, under that particular priority area. And so let me move on then to uh, uh, implementation and monitoring. What is important uh, uh, for us is, is to be clear about what it is uh, we can do. Uh, UNESCO set up the Memory of the World program uh, in 1992, um, and um, uh, last year a new structure was set up, the Documentary Heritage Unit, uh, to manage the Memory of the World program, uh, to give it greater coherence within within the communication and information sector. Uh, and that, in a way, is meant to ensure that we have the staffing and the resources that is required to carry out our work. Uh, but at the same time, we need to look at ourselves in terms of how we relate to the different entities that are there, uh, not least um, our International Advisory uh, Committee and its subcommittees, uh, and we've got uh, some members of the International Advisory Committee here, deliberately so, uh, because they need to be uh, following uh, some of the things that we are doing strategically in order for them to better support us uh, with their advice. So in discharging this function, uh, the unit uh, will draw upon the valuable expertise residing inter alia in the following. The International Advisory Committee and its subcommittees regional and national memory of, of the world committees. Again, these uh, were well represented yesterday uh, and today. If you see online, you will notice that we've got uh, participants uh, from uh, national memory of the world committees. We've got uh, participants from uh, our regional committees, uh, the president of, uh, of, of ACMO, which is the African um, um, chapter, is, 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 is here also. Uh, yesterday we heard from, uh, from, from, from MOLAC, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. They're all here in order to lock into uh, what we are doing uh, uh, because we believe that it is only through them that we can uh, properly uh, uh, support uh, our, our stakeholders. And quite clearly we also have here international uh, partner organizations, not least uh, Europeana, uh, and related uh, UN agencies. At, at least uh, we had one at the first edition of the Global Policy Forum. Going forward then, monitoring of the activities under this uh, strategic framework will be undertaken by a variety of mechanisms, including country reports on the implementation of the 2015 recommendation. What you need to know is that our member states are required to report every four years to the General Conference uh, of UNESCO on how they have implemented the 2015 recommendation. So uh, an event like this one could in fact influence that process because we as the Secretariat of the Memory of the World Program um, uh, are tasked with, with, with the responsibility of uh, preparing a reporting template, a questionnaire that member states then use uh, in order to collect data. So we can very easily, based on our discussions, inject a few perspectives uh, a few analytical categories, a few um, uh, research categories, if you will, into that, into that template, uh, thereby influencing how member states uh, gather data. And so DRR could potentially feature uh, in that. And also the work of regional and national memory of the world committees could be enhanced uh, with, with, uh, with, with um, perspectives from us here. And we envisage that outputs from all these processes will be fed back into the implementation of both our regular program activities. Um, th these are activities that are funded uh, through uh, um, um, member states' subventions and subsequent phases of the ongoing uh, project supported uh, by Japan. We are moving into the second uh, phase and that second phase um, uh, has different 
elements that touch on some of the issues that we are talking about here, uh, including uh, targeted digitization efforts in memory institutions, especially in, in, in Africa and, 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 and seeds. So there you have it. This is our strategic uh, uh, framework and uh, the, uh, the, the panels that have been developed are meant to respond to varying degrees to this particular uh, strategic uh, framework. So they'll be taking up the issues in some detail and getting some, uh, some, some, some commentary from you, uh, from those uh, uh, online uh, through, uh, through the chat. And so we'll be monitoring this um, uh, carefully uh, over the coming uh, weeks, uh, month, even, and that is why for, for continued feedback, uh, you're invited, of course, uh, to send uh, any email to our generic uh, member of the world uh, email, uh, email address, and we'd be happy to, uh, to, to, to find ways of incorporating your perspectives into, into the framework. Uh, which will place online and will continue to update as, 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 as new developments uh, occur. Thank you, Sumi. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Banda. If we looked at point number one there that Mr. Banda introduced of the strategic framework, understanding understanding disaster risk reduction uh, in, as it pertains to uh, the preservation of documentary heritage. That is going to guide our first panel discussion today because the panel discussion is about knowing the risk, so indeed understanding it. Uh, it is about investing in disaster risk sorry, reduction for resilience, and this is something that was highlighted quite a bit yesterday, how current disasters have enhanced our understanding of risk management and prompted some of our memory institutions to invest more in disaster risk reduction and in resilience. And again, the resilience of these institutions can serve as best practices. And that is indeed what we're gonna discuss. So I'd like to introduce uh, our guests, our panelists for this first discussion, again, on knowing the risk. So first is Ms. Claire McGuire. She's a policy and research officer of cultural heritage at IFLA. That's the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. She will be presenting on the role of libraries that they have uh, to play in times of disaster. Also next to Ms. McGuire is Ms. Jocelyn Deschaux. She's the president of the Blue Shield France. Welcome as well. She will tell us about the role of the French Blue Shield in the preservation of documentary heritage here in France. Uh, seating, seated just behind, but also very much a part of our panel discussion is Mr. Papa Moma Diop. Uh, just briefly to explain, we obviously have to uh, be careful of social distancing regulations, which is why Mr. Diop is seated just behind, but of course is an active part of this panel. Uh, he is the Vice President of the Memory of the World International Advisory Committee, President of the Memory of the World African Regional Committee. And again, we heard the contribution from Mr. Diop yesterday. And uh, at the end of the table, you see Ms. Rita Chinfu. She's the director of the National Archives Suriname. She's also a member of the uh, IAC and MOW program. And uh, she's going to tell us about how Suriname is developing emergency management and disaster preparedness plans. So we have a wide array of views and experience here on this panel. And I would, of course, like to introduce our facilitator for this panel discussion, who also spoke yesterday, if you were part of the program. Mr. Soichiro Yasukawa is a program specialist for the Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience Program at the Section for Earth Sciences and Geohazard Risk. So, uh, Mr. Yasukawa, I will hand over to you at this point. Uh, thank you, Sumi, and uh, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, uh, Excellencies, and yeah, Excellencies and uh, Excellencies and colleagues. Yes, uh, my name is Soichi Yaskawa. I'm going to be a moderator for the next 90 minutes of the session A, which is called uh, Know the Risk, Understanding Disaster Risk Management and Investing in Disaster Risk Reduction for resilience. So I believe that this is a 
Priority Action 1 and 3 of the Sendai framework, yes, it's important that we understand the risk and make scenario and take actions. So understanding the risk is a crucial first step for the good disaster risk management. And as uh, Faxon, our colleague, uh, explained about uh, a uh, draft strategic framework, we would like to discuss how we can bring another elements or another points for this uh, draft. So I would like to encourage the participants in Paris and also online to actively engage on this uh, uh, sessions. So please don't hesitate to write to us on the chat box or raise questions after the presentations. So we try to limit our presentation around in one hour so that we can take around 20, 30 minutes for discussion, question, and answers. So without further ado, we uh, know that to save time, I would like to invite the first panelist, uh, Korea Maguire. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you to the UNESCO Memory of the World Secretariat for organizing and inviting me to take part in this forum. Um, thank you to Mr. Faxon Banda for in his introduction and outline of the strategic framework draft. And thank you to um, Soichiro Yasukawa for facilitating this panel discussion. Dear esteemed colleagues, I'm very happy to join you today for this second Memory of the World Global Policy Forum on the critical and timely topic of disaster risk reduction and management. My name is Claire McGuire. I am a policy and research officer at the International Federation of Libraries, Associations, and Institutions, IFLA. In my intervention today, I will give some insight into how helping libraries understand and invest in disaster risk reduction contributes to sustainable preservation of documentary heritage and how IFLA supports this effort, highlighting several initiatives. For a brief introduction, IFLA is the global voice of libraries. We represent over 1,400 members from 150 countries in all regions and work together with a large network of volunteers. We work both to help libraries around the world provide the best possible services to users and to advocate for the policies and laws that will facilitate this work. We are happy to work with UNESCO in many areas, including Memory of the World, on a shared objective that is so close to the heart of libraries, preserving and promoting access to the world's documentary cultural heritage in all its forms. Within our work, we recognize that libraries have an essential role to play in times of disaster. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, in terms of safeguarding heritage to support recovery and also in acting as community hubs, sharing resources and even offering a through line for access to information and education during and after disaster. For instance, IFLA has found examples of libraries acting as community gathering spaces, providing essential services and support in the immediate aftermath of disasters, including hurricanes and wildfires. Beyond this, there's an important intersection to be recognized in disaster risk management between material held in institutions like libraries, community identity, and cultural rights, recalling yesterday's presentation on social memory. I point to an example from the 2020 report of the Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, Ms. Karima Benoon, on cultural rights and climate change. This report details a visit to the island of Tuvalu, whose only library sits 20 meters from the shore and is threatened by sea level rise. The collection contains irreplaceable historical documents as well as critical records for climate research. The librarian is determined to save this collection as its loss would impact Tuvaluans as well as the collective knowledge of humanity. According to the report, an official asks, if we are not here anymore, what will happen to our culture? In her address to IFLA's World Library and Information Congress 2021, Special Rapporteur Benoon stressed that libraries and archives may often act as cultural rights defenders, protecting cultural rights, such as the right to participate in cultural life, to enjoy the arts, and to share in scientific advancements. Enjoyment of these rights faces numerous threats, including climate change, and the Special Rapporteur identified that the single greatest 
this climate change as the single greatest threat to cultural rights. However, on a positive note, she stressed in her address that culture and cultural institutions like libraries have a core role in identifying, imagining, and constructing solutions. Taking steps to minimize risk to cultural institutions and their collections is therefore a critical step to fulfill its, this potential and enable participation in finding solutions to current and future threats. The impact of disaster on culture features in the Sendai framework, along with a shift in focus towards preparation, prevention, and mitigation. This framework mandates national governments work to understand the cultural heritage impacts of disasters and promote or support the protection of culture and collecting institutions. Libraries are among these institutions. The Sendai framework outlines the need for stakeholders to work together in all areas of risk reduction. This means that libraries should view their creation of their own disaster risk reduction plans as part of a larger effort to safeguard cultural heritage and build cultural resilience for their communities before, during, and after the event of a disaster. Given the framework's mandate to national governments, it also means they should be able to count on the necessary legal and financial support from governments and funders to implement meaningful risk management and response solutions. For any library professionals that may be involved in today's program, some steps that can be taken towards greater inclusion of libraries and their collections in national risk reduction plans include finding out if your country has a disaster risk strategy in line with the Sendai framework, checking if the strategy includes cultural heritage or the role of libraries. If not, gather evidence from your own experience and that of your colleagues, as well as the information provided in this forum to help make a case for it to be included. And finally, connect to a network, such as your National Library Association, National Committee of the Blue Shield, or your National or Regional Memory of the World Committee. Working within networks is a great segue into the role of IFLA in helping to build capacity for libraries to prepare for and respond to disaster. IFLA's approach to disaster risk reduction focuses on sharing knowledge and building capacity across our global network, emphasizing preparation, prevention, and mitigation in line with the Sendai framework. IFLA provides tools to help libraries take primary steps towards disaster management. The IFLA principles of engagement in library-related activities in times of conflict, crisis, or disaster is the highest level document that IFLA has produced related to disaster risk management. This document advises IFLA and its members on how to monitor areas at risk, advocate for, and raise awareness about disaster prevention. When disaster strikes, the principles guide recovery activities and advise members if and how to engage. IFLA's Preservation and Conservation PAC network has greatly extended our ability to help members prepare for and respond to disaster. The PAC Center Network created Disaster Preparedness and Planning, a brief manual, a practical guide to disaster preparedness for the global library field, which takes users through steps of the disaster planning process. These tools and others, um, such as the frequently asked questions on disaster assessment and reduction can be downloaded from IFLA's website. Further, our PAC Center centers monitor potential risks in their regions, build networks with key contacts, and help IFLA connect our international partners to local stakeholders during response and recovery efforts. This has proven extremely beneficial, for example, in coordination of our response to the Beirut blast in 2020, as IFLA worked with our PAC Center hosted at Qatar National Library to support our members in Lebanon. Through our experience in responding to disasters, the critical need for information in early stages after disaster strikes has become apparent. This information includes the types of materials that may be particularly at risk, the location of libraries and memory institutions that may be affected, key contacts in those institutions, and information on steps that are already in place to help mitigate risk. After disaster strikes, it becomes increasingly difficult to gather this information and that can inform possible interventions and recovery efforts. Therefore, this sort of information mapping is a crucial step in preparedness. IFLA's risk register helps us work to prevent the loss of documentary heritage and support libraries in the event of disaster. It can help us respond quickly when disaster strikes and be better informed in our engagement with interna the international community in facilitating a response. The IFLA risk register is not a public register. 
It is a confidential list of documentary heritage materials and collections that may be at risk from climate change, natural disaster, armed con conflict, and beyond. We seek to use this tool to provide additional contribution to efforts to manage risk to documentary heritage materials. When necessary and with permission, IFLA could share this information on the register with partners such as UNESCO and Blue Shield International, of which IFLA is one of the four founding institutions alongside ICA, ICOM, and ECOMOS. Beyond information on the material or collection, the register collects key contact information for collection owners and national response agencies, details on legal matters such as copyright and administrative responsibility, identification of possible risks, and information on any disaster mitigation steps that have already been taken. In addition to the register itself, IFLA is building a toolkit of materials to help librarians and library professionals engage further in risk reduction by assessing and responding to risk. The three steps of the risk register toolkit include recognize, encouraging users to assess risk, register, taking users through the steps to make an application, and react, providing users with tools and guidelines produced by IFLA and others with steps that can, they can take now to mitigate risk. Looking ahead, we hope to continue expanding use of IFLA's risk register and invite partners such as those working um, in memory institutions at all levels to help connect potential collection holders with the register as a step to enhance preparedness efforts. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to present another initiative that IFLA has been involved with that very much aligns with the topic of sustainable preservation of documentary heritage. We acknowledge that the preservation of and access to documentary heritage in all forms includes digital heritage. The vast quantity and diversity of digital heritage, which is constantly increasing, presents a unique challenge concerning the selection of what digital material to preserve for the long term. The Persist Project was established in 2013 following a UNESCO Memory of the World Conference in Vancouver, Canada, that examines this, this issue. The project's content, content task force, consisting of members from UNESCO, the International Council on Archives, ICA, and IFLA, was created to, to develop guidelines to assist decision makers and practitioners make informed decisions about what digital resources should or must be kept for the long term. The first edition of the guidelines for the selection of digital heritage for long-term preservation was launched in 2016. However, we know that five years is a long time in the digital ecosystem, and it was felt necessary to bring the guidelines up to date. The, per the Persist Content Task Force, under the Preservation Subcommittee of UNESCO Memory of the World, is now excited to debut the second edition of these guidelines. Representatives from ICA, the International Council on Museums, ICOM, and IFLA, as well as other experts, developed the second edition of these guidelines over the past year. Given the complexity of digital preservation, this new edition has been expanded to two parts, an impact of digital preservation on selection and a deeper look at collecting in the digital environment. The Persist Contest Content Task Force acknowledges the vast array of digital material and the many different contexts in which selection decisions are made. This isn't a one-size-fits-all solution, but rather a starting point. So I invite anyone interested to explore these new guidelines, which are now available on IFLA's website um, in English, Arabic, and Spanish, thanks to the generous support from UNESCO on translations. To tie this back to the topic of the forum, taking steps to safeguard heritage in digital form is also an aspect of preparedness to consider for sustainable preservation of, document, of documentary heritage. Memory institutions can elaborate selection, selection policies for the long-term preservation as a meaningful step towards ensuring access to these materials of value to their communities now and in the future. I want to say thank you again to UNESCO, Memory of the World, for their support, and thank you to all members of the writing group, to ICA, ICOM, and all experts involved in this project. As a word of, of closing, IFLA's involvement in these initiatives with our partners, with our membership, and with our network of volunteers are all efforts to build capacity for librarians around the world to take steps to reduce and manage risk. Through this, we work to contribute to international efforts towards sustainable preservation of documentary heritage. 
We stand ready to contribute to the strategic framework, continue advocating for the role of documentary heritage and the memory institutions who safeguard it in strengthening the resilience of our societies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Korea, for your uh, concrete actions by IFLA, such as uh, register or tool keys and also the persist program. I think it's uh, interesting you know, practices for further discuss. Okay, so let's go to the next uh, panelist, uh, Jocelyn, the floor is yours. Thank you. Bonjour à tous. Good morning to all of you present here or online. I'm Céline Deschamps, uh, President, Chairman of the Bouclier Bleu France, and I'd like to thank UNESCO and the Memoir du Monde, the members of the world and the people of Japan for this invitation for us to attend the Forum on Disaster uh, Risk Prevention, which is really the spearhead of, of um, our action. As we all know today, cultural heritage in its full diversity, and in particular the documentary heritage, is a major component of uh, identities, of people's identities. Therefore, it's fragile uh, and vulnerable if the, a disaster occurs, natural or not. In order to avoid the damage, which is also often irreversible, cultural heritage must be protected upstream. So therefore, the Bouclier Bleu, the Blue Shield, was founded in 2001. It was called the French Committee of the uh, Blue Shield until 2020. Now it's called Blue Shield France. It's an NGO recognized to be of public utility, which is uh, the French branch of Blue Shield International, cre created in 1987 by the ICA, uh, the International Council of Museums, ECOM, ECOMAS, and IFLA. Uh, they're, they're too much of uh, cultural heritage was destroyed during the Second World War, and that's what led to the Hague Convention of May 14, 1954, for the protection of the cultural heritage in the event of armed conflict. The Blue Shield became a, uh, uh, an emblem which, is, uh, which when uh, displayed on certain buildings, should protect them from destruction. Uh, wrought by war. The Interna uh, Blue Shield International has ten major objectives. First of all, to protect uh, heritage from the consequences of uh, armed conflicts and disasters, to promote the ratification of the Hague Convention and its protocols, to enhance awareness of cultural heritage in crisis situations, to promote and organize training uh, events, to promote the commitment of communities in protecting cultural property, and to encourage the cooperation of the stakeholders in crisis situations. The Blue Shield. It, today in France focuses on protecting uh, cultural heritage during uh, natural catastrophes and disasters because fortunately we 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 don't have armed uh, any armed conflict on our territory and uh, Blue Shield France represents about uh, the group of experts that can provide advice to decision makers and professionals when a disaster uh, occurs that threatens uh, cultural heritage. Therefore, its field of action is vast. Libraries, archives, uh, uh, graphic arts, museums, uh, when it comes to the documentary heritage, but also museums, uh, monuments and sites, remarkable gardens, archaeological sites as well. When it, uh, when it comes to uh, the full range of uh, cultural heritage. Uh, Blue Shield France recently uh, uh, did a, uh, listed the different uh, disasters that uh, affected cultural heritage in France since the beginning of the 20th century. Such a list, of course, cannot be exhaustive, unfortunately, 
uh, but there is some 300 disasters recorded. However, it is very enlightening when it comes to understanding the risks for uh, uh, the cultural, uh, uh, the tangible cultural heritage. For the documentary cultural heritage, there were 38 disasters on uh, archive centers or libraries since 1999. Uh, 17 were, were, were due to uh, poor weather. However, uh, the uh, this is not exhaustive because uh, disasters against the documentary heritage are still a, a taboo in France for uh, conservation institutions and therefore they're not always uh, publicized. Uh, there were 72 disasters of all sorts uh, cultural heritage in France uh, that is one every two days in the period 2019 to 2020 which is absolutely incredible and this uh, they occurred in all regions of France which an average of six per region six uh, amongst the 72 51 percent were fires 20 percent during a uh, building work 33 percent were due to water damage 70 percent due to heavy rains or, or storms that is climate change which we've already discussed 30 percent uh, involve uh, uh, serious uh, uh, damage, uh, three to four on a scale of one, zero to five. These figures confirm the need to take this problem most seriously. And I would like to underscore the importance of this meeting for uh, uh, disaster risk reduction and organizing long-term conservation for, the docu for our documentary heritage. Amongst the figures that I just provided, the documentary heritage constitutes uh, a relatively small share, 7% of uh, disasters uh, involving the cultural heritage involve the documentary heritage, but that low figure is also due to the fact that it's difficult to, to, to record this sort of, um, of a disaster which is often underdeclared. The, the uh, documentary heritage is particularly vulnerable, whether it's preserved in archival centers, uh, the municipal or regional or in libraries, municipal libraries, or other um, or other sorts of libraries such as university libraries, but also in uh, graphic art museums or in uh, maison d'écrivain. They're fragile because of their basically organic. Uh, composition and uh, their uh, and their reaction to climate uh, conditions. I spoke about the vulnerability of the documentary heritage, which you're very familiar with. Here are some examples of uh, disasters affecting that heritage. So, therefore, amongst these different. Uh, d uh, types of, of uh, disasters. There are fires, floods, but also explosions, or, or for example, uh, I would like to emphasize um, I'm trying to find the right slide. The, I'd, like to uh, I'd like to emphasize sort of day-to-day -day incidents such as water damage because of plumbing problems, uh, for example, which, if they are not rapidly dealt with and appropriately dealt with, can also bring about major damage or even destruction of uh, heritage. Uh, if there's no... Uh, if there's no immediate reaction within 48 hours to a leak, uh, that can uh, lead to the development of mold, which is a major risk. And these day-to-day -day risks occur very often in all of the uh, heritage conservation establishments. What measures can be taken to counter these disasters. One of the specific problems of the documentary heritage is that it's often ill-known when f floods occur, for example. Uh, uh, very few people think about the, com the uh, municipal archives that are often kept in uh, cellars underground. Uh, no one thinks about storing them in, in more secure places. 
uh, d d d uh, despite uh, the uh, major activities of the departmental archival centers, no one thinks about uh, bringing them up to a, a higher level. No one thinks about it when the flood occurs, when the water rises. No one thinks about evacuating the documents because a lot of other problems occur at the same time. Uh, for example, human lives are threatened, and that, of course, takes priority over the safeguarding of cultural heritage. For libraries, the situation is about the same. If 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 the firemen are are are, 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 are aren't aware of this problem, uh, they don't necessarily consider the fact that there might be documentary heritage in these public libraries as well. And uh, there, uh, for example, if, if someone intervenes in a library, they think about museum collections, but they don't necessarily think about safeguarding or saving library collections. Also, the uh, elected officials aren't necessarily aware of the problem, as well as risk management experts. In the very frequent occurrences, uh, they often don't realize that the written documentary heritage is just as important as the museum heritage or the architectural heritage, or at any rate, it's just as vulnerable and fragile, even if it's less visible. Given the risks of flooding of um, natural origin, there are uh, risk prevention plans, the PPRI, for floods. Most uh, municipalities have such a plan, but no recommendation, especially uh, aims particularly at uh, cultural heritage and particularly documentary heritage. The, the municipalities sh must draft um, municipal uh, safeguarding plans. And uh, the, the, there's the DCRIM, the, the uh, Municipal Document of Information on Major Risks. But those documents seldom uh, have special uh, provisions concerning this sort of risk. Uh, Europe has uh, passed a directive uh, requiring each member state to uh, deal with the risks uh, of of, um, of disasters. Uh, in France, a national strategy for flood management risks called the SNGRI was adopted in July 2014. Along those lines, uh, the authorities in the framework of action pram plans for the prevention of floods uh, well, 122 territories of, with major risk were identified as priorities. The municipal safeguarding plans uh, centralize all of the recommendations and set up a chain of alert in order to uh, warn the, um, risk, uh, the, uh, the establishments that face risks. One of uh, our activities is to make sure that, uh, cult that heritage um, uh, properties be integrated in all of the flood management plans and should be part of the uh, chain of alert. Uh, that the, the people responsible for managing heritage must be put in the front line and the proper and uh, uh, proper um, uh, measures must be taken. Recommendations must be made. These measures, called the safeguarding plan or emergency plan for the cultural heritage, can be implemented if an earthquake, a storm, or another natural disaster occurs. Another solution is, of course, planning, planning ahead, the, the, the safeguarding plan or the emergency plan. The uh, Blue uh, Shield uh, drafted a uh, manual in ten, uh, with uh, um, 10 stages. The idea is to reduce the risk, to prevent, to anticipate damage, and also to be fully prepared uh, for the reaction to be the most appropriate possible if a disaster occurs despite everything and to reduce the impact on collections. That is part of a cultural heritage safeguard plan and it must be organized uh, upstream. Uh, we must bring together the necessary uh, material for for uh, disaster risk management, then there should have to be safeguarding places where the most vulnerable and most precious uh, collections can be evacuated to, and hu the proper human resources have to be trained and identified. They have to be provided with procedures, and the command chain has to be identified. So, uh, uh, annual drills is also a, a good way to give concrete training to the uh, teams that are responsible for emergency response. There's another important moment which was highlighted, what with the uh, confinement in 2020, 
and we've already spoken about this. That is the surveillance of collections when there is a prolonged um, absence of the staff in charge of conservation. Uh, uh, Blue Shield France drafted an, uh, a uh, practical guide uh, to provide for a sanitary and security watch for collections. Uh, to, to, to give upstream uh, instructions makes it possible to avoid many risks and much damage to sites, works, and collections. As you can see, uh, Blue Shield France is developing its activities in, along three different lines, before, during, and after a disaster. The preventive phase is particularly important. That is to evaluate risks and to raise the awareness of professionals, decision makers, and the public to real threats, to improve the risk prevention, to train professionals to, uh, to intervene in the event of disaster, and to uh, thus prevent uh, over uh, degradation. We uh, assist in the drafting of emergency plans for, pa uh, for heritage institutions. We organize m drills in real situations, often set up in cooperation with several of the departmental uh, emergency services, and that makes it possible for the different sectors to get training as to how best to react. Uh, there's a, a film called A Pied d'Oeuvre, uh, which was made in uh, 2019 on a drill that took place the year before, and you can find that on the Blue Shield's website. Uh, risk prevention has to uh, be developed amongst those responsible for uh, the heritage, but also uh, all the uh, authorities, both civilian and military, and the firemen. Uh, we provide um, workshops to each of these segments, and we also encourage mayors to identify in their municipal safeguarding plan the elements of, of heritage that constitute the culture of the municipality. we can have uh, context for direct advice. Uh, feedback on experience is also very important to have proper reaction to any type of disaster. So in this way, we had a workshop organized in January 2020, which gave witness to that. Blue Shield France has also got many local sections. We presently have six. You can see the different sections here on the screen. Grand Est, Ile de France, Atlantique, Bassin du Rhône, Pigarmet, and Tarn Aviron. They help to draft emergency plans to carry out local plans with human resources training or organization of exercises on fires or floods that have actually happened. The strength of the Blue Shield is really its multi-sectoral nature, archives, libraries, historical sites, etc., etc., as well as the diversity of its members who come from the world of heritage, obviously, but also from uh, disaster planning and risk management. And this is one of the major recommendations that we have for working in networks locally, first of all, and then in a broader scale after that. Individual measures show how different establishments and local authorities are becoming more and more aware of these problems. The goal to be met is for each establishment conserving the heritage sites concerned have drafted a disaster management plan before disasters happen. There are constraints. We don't have a lot of budget. It only comes from members' dues. We don't have any uh, official subsidies, which means we don't have any full-time employees. And we are only 300 members in France, which means that we cannot answer all the requests that are made of us. But we do essentially remain in an advisory training role and that of producing resources. The work to be done is enormous. The stakes we're playing for are high. France Blue Shield is trying to add its own modest stone to the building of cultural heritage protection in France. Thank you very much. Um.
thank you, Jesselyn. Uh, thank you very much for sharing with us your activities on guidelines. And also, I like the drill with the firefighters so that the firefighters don't damage too much while they are doing their services. Okay, let's invite the next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Papa uh, Munao Diop. Thank you very much. Excellence, Monsieur le Ministre. Your Excellency, Minister, colleagues, those who are here in Paris and those who are online, I would like to give you a summary of our regional workshop on capacity building for herit documental par heritage preservation for memory institutions in Africa, reduction and management of disaster risk. This happened at Sali in Senegal from the 15th to the 17th of June uh, 2021. So my presentation will be structured around three different points. First of all, feedback in the area of disaster reduction and management of disaster risk in different documentary institutions in Africa. Then a second part, a case study on a preparation plan in terms of, uh, and also response to catastrophes. This was uh, an initiative of our Japanese colleagues. And then finally, there will be a series of practical exercises for response to disaster or catastrophe in documentary heritage. And then finally, there will obviously be a conclusion so by way of introduction, I could say that with the support of uh, funds made available by the Japanese Minister of Education, Culture, and Sport, Science and Technology, and also through the Memory of the World program on the UNESCO side, a workshop was organized for capacity building on the preservation of documentary heritage for memory institutions in Africa with a focus on reduction and management of disaster risk. This meeting happened online and in Presentia in Sali in Senegal, as I said earlier, from June 15th to 17th, 2021. Had participation from directors or the representatives from national archives and libraries National Committees for Memory of the World and Research Centers from about 20 countries, including Benin, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Cabo Verde, Congo Brazzaville, Gabon, Democratic Republic of Camba, Gambia, Guinea, Guinea Conakry, Guinea Bissau, Kenya, Mali, Niger, Nigeria. Senegal, and Zimbabwe. This workshop is part of a perspective of developing know-how on management and prevention of disaster risk in memory institutions in Africa, and also strengthening the resilience of those same institutions given risks that have an impact on documentary heritage. After a sober opening ceremony, the workshop happened in a practical way in three phases. First of all, feedback on experience in reduction and management of disaster risk in different documentary institutions. Then case studies on the development of disaster preparation and response plans that happened in a virtual format, and then practical exercises for response to disasters on documentary heritage. So let me tell you about the first part, sharing experience in the field of reduction and management of disaster risk in different documentary institutions. We had different contributions. 
which concern the following. First of all, disasters and risks linked to flooding, old buildings, uh, poorly adapted buildings, a lack of funding, lack of trust between families that own documentary heritage and other institutions, armed conflicts, etc. There was also a point on the urgent need for memory institutions to develop their own emergency plans of a strategic nature. Then the need to have effective long-term preservation of documentary heritage given the risks of disaster. And different examples were cited, for instance, Mali, where many ancient manuscripts were destroyed by jihadists in the city of Tombuctu in 2012, or in the Republic of South Africa, where a fire destroyed a large share of the archives and works of the Library of Cape Town University in April 2021. Those were some of the cases that were mentioned. There have also been reference made to problems of the buildings where conservation is undertaken to generally state that standards are not respected in terms of choice of building sites, uh, close proximity to risk factors for documentary heritage, or the fact that they are being built in areas which could potentially be flooded or otherwise dangerous. Another subject was that of uh, storage areas, which sometimes are designed in a way that does not correspond to standards and which does not guarantee proper preservation of a durable nature of collections, and which means that they are therefore exposed to fluctuations of temperature and relative humidity, as well as internal or external pollutants. And then a second part of our workshop concerned these experiences I had mentioned for from the National Diet Library, the NDL in Japan. And here we had a case study on the development of a preparation and response plan for disasters. This was a virtual presentation made by Ms. Naoko Kobayashi, who is formerly the librarian, head librarian of the National Diet Library, the NDL, in Japan. So this presentation had five points. There was an overview and summary. Second point on changing attitudes vis-a-vis -vis disasters in the Japanese library community. Thirdly, a preparatory stage with uh, different experiments and errors that were made by the NDL. Elaboration of a custom-made, tailor-made disaster management plan for the NDL. And then the creation of a national network for management of disaster risk for cultural heritage. The national plan is made up of a program for safeguarding cultural items that was prepared by the Agency for Cultural Affairs from April 1st, 2011 through March 2013, with the cooperation of a committee made up of experts coming from 13 different establishments. This plan encouraged the creation of a national center and network for management of disaster risks. Uh, participants' contributions following that presentation brought out the fact that this Japanese experience is an exemplary case to be better prepared for catastrophe and disaster. And then finally, Emily Lemas, who is an expert consultant in the management of archives and files, made a series of practical exercises for us to respond to disasters. 
in the field of documentary heritage. These sessions concerned the following areas. Responding to disasters and then recovery, part one. Then same subjects with part two. Third, the exercises on wet paper and wet photos. And then how to be aware of one's environment, exercises on evaluating risks and a Parbika toolbox, which was basically a review of pre-workshop materials. There was also a disaster scenario, a simulation, where there was a team meeting with planning, priorities, and uh, specialized material. Then there was also the drafting of a disaster plan with coordination in case of disasters, co cooperation between institutions for cultural heritage and documentary heritage. And working out a plan, the participants had time to sketch out the major orientations of their own disaster management plans. There was also presentation of plans selected participants presented the draft framework plans for disaster management. And then we went over the course, evaluating it with participants' comments. An evaluation was carried out at the end of this three-day workshop. The results of this exercise were positive. And in fact, we saw that the meeting met the expectations of participations who appreciated the educational material and the relevance of the course, the educational approach that was participatory, which had been adopted, and the quality of the PowerPoint presentations. To conclude, or by way of conclusion, revolving around the recommendations which stem from this workshop and drawing the lessons of shared experience. Participations drew up a series of recommendations to better support memory institutions in Africa. These recommendations are made, first of all, for governments in Africa. The financing of these investment projects for the building of properly adapted structures for optimal and sustainable preservation of documentary heritage, integrating difficulties in disaster management and risks to heritage in documentary institutions in national plans to fight against disasters and then encourage the training of professionals in charge of documentary heritage customs, national defense, etc., in the prevention of and fight against disasters and risks. Concerning UNESCO, ICA, the International Archive Council, IFLA and ICOM, to get a contribution from the Center for Presentation and Conservation of French-speaking Africa of IFLA, which is hosted by Serdotela in Yaoundé for the preservation of African documentary heritage. And to support the member states setting up their national committees for memory of the world and Blue Shield by strengthening those which exist at the same time as ACMA. Uh, to encourage the formation of networks, sub-regional networks, by creating interactions between libraries, archives, and museums. And we were lucky enough to have with us online the president of ICA. And for IFLA, we have Ms. Markler, and certainly people from other institutions as well. And I would like to ask those ladies and gentlemen, to make our voice heard with ICA, IFLA, income, so as to support us in the implementation of these same recommendations. To conclude, we would like to launch 
an appeal to the African ambassadors to UNESCO or the representatives. I see the representative of Senegal here. Uh, good morning, Mr. Conte. And we would ask the ambassadors to be kind enough to make our voices heard with our government so that these recommendations which focus on guaranteeing that our documentary institutions can be safe and sustainably preserve our heritage and that these be welcomed favorably in our different countries because we can't talk about good governance or truly objective historiography or of relevant planning for sustainable development in a country which wouldn't have archives and hence no memory in generally speaking without documentary heritage. In such a country, memory institutions would be relegated to the status of poor relations. On the other hand, the application of these conclusions would greatly contribute to the implementation in Africa of the UNESCO 2015 recommendation concerning documentary heritage, including digital heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, Papa. And thank you very much for sharing with us the workshop, which includes 27 countries in Africa. I think it's, we would like to know more. But uh, let's go to the next uh, panelist, uh, Lita Jiang Fo. And uh, actually, I received a message from the organizer that uh, we need to close by 11.10. So if, and we also want to do some question and answer. So if you could, yeah, keep time in 10, 11, 12 minutes, it would be great. Thank you. So good morning, colleagues um, who are online all over the world. Um, and here in the room at the UNESCO headquarters. My name is Rita Chinfu. I am the director of the Natural Archives of Suriname, also member of the International Advisory Committee of the Memory of the World. I'm also the uh, member of uh, CARBICA and co-chair of the Caribbean Heritage Emergency Network. My presentation for today is about developing an emergency preparedness and disaster management plan for heritage institution in Suriname. Uh, before I started my intervention, I take this opportunity to thank Fax and Benda and his team, as well as the Japanese Fonds and Trusts for giving me the opportunity to take part in the second global policy forum. So the drawing you see on my first slide is from Pierre-Jacques Benoit. He was born in the 18th century, and during his visit to Suriname, he made hundreds of drawings of the daily life. And the drawing is titled Sibi Busi. That's the lingua franca in Suriname, the Sranang Tungo. And it's translated, literally translated as bushes who are swept away. This is to show you that hurricanes, tornadoes, and other natural disasters are not a new phenomenon. The difference between now and then is that the effects of climate change are now very disastrous, and that we need and we must take action now. <clears throat> Culture cannot wait. So I will go fast over the facts of Suriname. Looking at Suriname's population, we are a relative small country located on the north of South America. But at the same time, we have a rich history because of the history of our people. Our people were, recruit, were recruited from Africa as enslaved people, uh, also from Asia as endangered uh, people, from India, Indonesia, China, Madeira, and so on. We have the most diverse population in South America and the Caribbean. And about 87% of the population live in the low-lying coastal area, uh, which make us vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Allow me to address the work of the Natural Archives of Suriname. In short, uh, although we are small, 
uh, uh, we have uh, in the International Memory of the World, the International Register inscribed three documentary heritage and also in the Molak Regional Register, we have inscribed two documentary heritage. Furthermore, the inner city, oh, sorry. Furthermore, we see that also National Archives interested in, um, in, in our uh, young professionals. The first picture is about the young professionals do, doing an inspection in the district of Nikeri. You see how the archives are kept in shed and spread, spread all over the floor. It was in the early days when I began as an archivist in Suriname. It was really one of the bad experiences I had uh, as, as an archivist. And this, this was a lesson learned how we uh, not should keep or keep the archives. Furthermore, uh, the second uh, picture is about the restoration room in uh, our archive building. In 2010, we inaugurated our a new building with the support of the Dutch government. And we have a very modern restoration room. Uh, staff are very trained, our um, research room, where our youngsters, students, and researchers also do their research in our building. With regards to the national awareness in Suriname about the importance of disaster management, how did that start? Um, actually. The effects of climate change in the Caribbean region, uh, for instance, the hurricane in uh, Irma, Maria Jose, the earthquake in Haiti. In Suriname, we were confronted by the Sibibusis, the floodings of cities and villages in the district was really a wake-up call for us in Suriname. Although our disasters are not to be compared with the disasters in the Middle East and Africa, for us, this was important enough to, uh, to, 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 um, to, to be aware and that we have to do something. The turning point was the uh, conference of the Caribbean uh, branch of the International Council on Archives that was held in Suriname <clears throat> in 2019. And the theme was Archives at Risk, Preserving Caribbean uh, Heritage. A special round table was dedicated to national and international emergency response. And we even uh, invited Ms. Aparna Tandon from ICROM to address uh, the issues we had in Suriname, but also uh, all over the world. Furthermore, we invited the director of the National Coordination Center for Disaster Management uh, in Suriname. So in September 2019, again, I reached out to the documentary heritage stakeholder in Suriname because during the conference in March 2019, they expressed the need to have a disaster management plan in Suriname, and they asked the National Archives to coordinate this uh, training. So when I reached out in September 2019, again, they emphasized the need of this disaster training, and they requested that the National Archives should take the leadership role in this. You see the picture of the stakeholders over there. We reached out to Dr. Emily Lumas, and I noticed that Emily uh, also went to Senegal for the training, and she facilitated the training in Suriname in February 24 till 28. The training was very practical and hands-on. Participants were able to identify threats to their collection and buildings, visited heritage institutions, took part in discussion, and 42 attendees from heritage institutions, the Red Cross, the National Coordination Center for Disaster Management, fire department participated in the training. And by the end of the workshop, participants gained knowledge in disaster planning, identifying threats, uh, prioritizing collection, and, less, and so on. Last year, we met once, but due to the pandemic, lockdown, and limited opening of institution, we were not able to finalize our disaster management plan. 
um, or in our planning, the, or my plan is to begin the session again uh, before the end of 2021 and next year to have the, the plans ready by 2022. These are some pictures of the training. What were the outcome of this training? Um, we raised media awareness. Uh, media awareness is very really important regarding emergency preparedness and disaster management for the preservation of documentary heritage. We have to be aware that the media is also an important stakeholder in our, in our activities because they have to communicate the information to the, um, to the environment and also to the community. Also, very important, and um, I emphasize this because our colleague from um, the Blue Shield, and yesterday I noticed also um, Aparna mentioned this, representative from the fire, de pep, the, sorry, fire department mentioned that the workshop provided them with new insights. They were now aware of the importance of culture. Um, one of the firefighters, firefighters mentioned, and I quote, normally when a disaster occurs, our modus operandi is to go into a building with full force without care of the collection. It was an eye-opener to look from another perspective, that of the custodian. As a firefighter, I am now aware of the rare, unique, and irreplaceable value of, my collection, of the collection. And my concern now is to disseminate this knowledge with, to my colleagues. And the workshop provided me with the knowledge and awareness to protect the collection when entering a heritage institution to extinguish a fire or prevent a calamity." Unquote. And the presence of the fire department and the National Coordination Center for Disaster Management proved to be very important, helpful, and very useful. During the workshop, participants benefited from the knowledge because the first responders shared their experiences with them and also draw um, attention to certain possible risks and hazards. And again, participants agreed that building relationship and reaching out to uh, first, respond first responders was very important. Okay, looking at the time, I will go further with my uh, slide, the interdisciplinary approach. Uh, participants were representatives from various heritage institutions, not only the documentary heritage institution, but uh, the, the, the built heritage, monument sites, grassroots uh, organization, the herbarium, the natural zoological collection were also uh, included in this training. And I refer again, we are a very small country and we have to uh, use the resources very effectively and efficiently. So uh, the training was also endorsed by the National UNESCO Commission in Suriname, the Director of Culture and the Ministry of Home Affairs. And at an early stage, we reached out to the National Coordination Center, the Fire Department, uh, also to um, assist us with the disaster management plan. So uh, this is a picture of Mr. Jerry, or Colonel uh, Jerry Sleinhardt from the Natural Coordination Center for Disaster Management. And although he mentioned that uh, NCCR is responsible to uh, safeguard and manage uh, the disaster management in Suriname, he also mentioned that cultural heritage is not included yet in the Natural Coordination Center for Disaster Management. So what are the core responsibility of the NCCR? And you, I, I will not read the, the whole uh, responsibility, but in red, that's very important to us, is to stimulate and facilitate responsible partners in the development of uh, emergency plan in order to preserve national, cultural, and heritage uh, infrastructure. And Colonel Jerry Slenhardt was very ashamed to acknowledge that 
until recently he didn't address this issue enough. And that's an uh, important point to, to share with you. As heritage institution, we have to go out from our comfort zone and reach out to the National Coordination Center for Disaster Management. But because um, he, he acknowledged um, before the, the training that without my, um, my, my uh, communication with him, he uh, wouldn't reach out to, to us himself. So what's the management structure of the NCCR? Um, so this is the whole structure, and you see that culture heritage is not included yet. So um, in the coming months, we will uh, include this in the, the, the structure. And on regional level, this is from the Sedema Emergency in, um, Agency. The Caribbean is divided in four sub regions. And what the chair or the, yeah, the director of Sedema also uh, communicated with, uh, with us was that all the uh, countries, island, uh, and the sub region has to start their alliances with the sub region. And then culture can be added to, to Sedema structure. Uh, these are the steps that we still have to take. Uh, we have to go to the interior, uh, start the drill, and also one important thing uh, as a, a takeaway take was uh, that the Suriname uh, Heritage Institution uh, launched the Suriname Heritage Network uh, to exchange experiences, ideas, solutions, and so on. Conclusion. So collaboration and networking on national and regional uh, level with uh, heritage institution, first responders, local communities are very important and also government institution uh, to reach specific objectives um, with regards to preservation uh, and access of documentary heritage. And it's imperative to identify strong national institution, regional, uh, networks, organization to spearhead all this initiative because we notice ICROM, IFLA, ICA, the UNESCO, they are all um, organizing workshop training, but as uh, Mr. Fox and Banda said, we, there must be a government uh, structure. Uh, the governance has to be uh, taken care of. So thank you, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Rita, and um, thank you very much for your reflection, and I think it's encouraging to learn that in Suriname, I think a uh, documentary heritage uh, DRR could be incorporated into the national framework on disaster risk reduction. And I think we need to close this session by 11.10, according to the uh, organizers. So I would like to open the floor for any questions you have Maybe I, we pick up one or two for the panelists. So if you have any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to yeah, raise your hand or put it on the chat box, etc. Yes, please. Hello. I should like to ask a question in Spanish, if I may. What are countries doing? How can we offer guidance to countries who don't actually have the institutional articulation and, um, that, that you might have here in France, for example? This is a question I wanted to ask because um, while boosting uh, um, robust uh, institutions uh, uh, or when uh, when uh, when countries want to uh, to get more in detail and, and more operational on this how can we offer guidance to those countries and secondly how to ensure uh, trust uh, among countries uh, and encourage them to register um, uh, their archives on the MOW 
Radio International Register. So some there is some confidential information. There are there is data that might need protection. So are there initiatives that are undertaken uh, recently to undertake surveys and get um, and data specifically on that? And if uh, data significant and important data needs to be uh, protected. Um, uh, against uh, against disasters, for example, uh, you know, floods or fires. Uh, I'm just wondering, how can we ensure the confidentiality? How do we build trust? I think that's another really important issue. In other words, we've got to somehow build trust so that the, so that people and countries will entrust that sensitive information to the register. And those were my two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I think one of the first one of the first questions I think it could be for uh, Blue Seas or uh, yeah IFA and uh, yeah no pre yeah, please or, yeah, okay, yeah please. I I would be happy to um, to speak to that and, uh, and if any of my other colleagues would like to too I'll keep it very brief. Um, just on your first point, I think you've touched on a very critical aspect. Um, of capacity building in that we need to acknowledge that uh, we need to meet different people and institutions where they are and make sure that there isn't a barrier um, to taking any steps towards disaster risk reduction, um, a barrier in believing that it's too high of a standard and that can't be met. So um, any approaches that we take need to be adapted to the various levels of capacity and we need to find ways that we can recommend steps that can be taken in institutions at, um, at various levels of capacity that even if it can't be to, if, even if disaster management can't be to a international standard, steps can be taken. Um, to your second point, I can speak to IFLA's risk register. Um, it's a developing project and we are still um, working on awareness raising or building trust as you say, but the idea behind it being a confidential register is um, exactly as you say that some of this information might be very confidential and people might be, or collections owners might be afraid that to, to have that information out. So um, our register isn't for awareness raising purposes or um, um, advocation, advocating purposes, it's for, um, it's, it, it is confidential as you, as, as you point out. So I think it, and it acts as a complement to other registers such as the memory of the world's registers um, which function in more of a, an advocate, an advocacy capacity. Um, so I, th from my perspective, that was just points I had on, on those questions. And I'm happy to hand back over to you. When it comes into creating national committees uh, for the uh, uh, Blue Shield, it really does uh, depend on the personnel in each country. Uh, it's up to them to set up a, a small hub of, or cluster of motivated people who are working in that area and then see with the Blue Shield International to see how uh, that uh, should move forward uh, um, if you want to create the Blue Shield at the national level. But uh, several national committees are currently being constituted in different parts of the world and uh, more and more parliaments are contacting us and, it's, and they're realizing it's not actually all that difficult. Um, so essentially it, all you need to do is have a couple of reference people who are prepared to, uh, to take the initiative and, uh, and then um, uh, dovetail with the institutions to make it happen. If I were to respond to your second question, Yolia, I would say that, uh, well, as you know, there are uh, libraries, uh, archives, uh, different uh, places where collections are housed. Uh, and we do have indeed a lot of uh, sensitive uh, documents uh, and information. And, um, you know, dissemination could actually breach uh, state secrets uh, or uh, private uh, or private uh, privacy rights. Uh, so we do need to be aware of that. But in the same, right, in the same line, 
I think you've got to have a, uh, some kind of legislation for um, archives and which will address uh, the, um, the question, question of access uh, uh, to the archives. We have an archival law in Senegal, for example, which regulates uh, uh, access to sensitive information. And we have what we call the uh, the time frame for divulgation, and essentially this stipulates the length of time under which uh, documentation need, need need to remain under seal, um, depending on the uh, the sensitivity of the notion. Now we could be they could be, this could be to do with people's uh, health data. It could be state secrets, defence, etc. And then in the recent period uh, where we've seen uh, the explosion of social media, we realize that also there are confidential and sensitive uh, data uh, that are at risk. Uh, and everything concerning uh, people's right to privacy, here again, I always, again, speaking of Senegal, I could say that we actually, who we do actually have uh, a board that deals with this issue and uh, looks at uh, access uh, issues concerning this kinds of sensitive information. So that's how I wanted to answer your question. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, thank you very much, Papa, for taking the uh, uh, second question, and I think I hand over to the yeah, hand over to Sumi. Thank you. Thank you as well, Mr. Yasukawa, for the expert facilitating of this panel, and to all of the panelists for your contribution. If we could get just a brief round of applause for this panel. We are a little bit over time. I just want to mention that one of the, the big points that we heard in all of these presentations is the power of networks, of how regional, local, national, and global institutions can work together. And we're going to pick up on that point just after we come back from our break. So please do enjoy a brief break and just about half past, so it's around 15 minutes from now, we'll come back with our second panel. And we enjoyed that engagement just now, so please continue bringing your questions to the fore and, and your comments as well. Thank you.
Welcome back, Welcome everyone. Back, everyone. We, have, we have a little, a little echo. echo. I'll just wait for that to be great. Thank you very much. Welcome back. We are ready to start with our second panel discussion. And I just want to extend my thanks again to all of you who are joining us on our stream in our Zoom webinar for your active participation, your following of all of the presentations, your comments. Uh, they are being uh, actively watched and observed here, and uh, we are thankful for, for those. And I would say something that we've seen actively in the chat is a discussion about how to share resources, how to work together. And that's precisely what we want to discuss in this second panel discussion of the day. It is about the power of networks, the strengthening uh, risk governance through networking. And I would like to bring in our expert facilitator who will take us through and tell us a bit more about what to expect from this panel and take us through the panel as well. Uh, you will remember Mr. Lota Yoran uh, as well from yesterday in his presentation uh, from the vice chair of the International Advisory Committee of the Memory of the World Program and the chair of SCEAR Education and Research Subcommittee. So Mr. Yoran, I hand uh, the podium over to you. Thank you, Sumi. Hello. I'll take off the mask, sorry. <laughs> Starts to get a tradition we want to get rid of as soon as possible. Now, uh, hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, Sumi has given an introduction, an introduction into the task of this panel and I just want to make some more remarks. Uh, we, this panel follows the questions by Fex and Banda this morning to, to help developing a, a action framework, a strategy for disaster risk reduction in memory of the world. And it follows uh, the Sendai framework, priority two, strengthening disaster risk governance to manage disaster risk. For that purpose, the Sendai framework asks, among other things, for collaboration and partnership across mechanisms and institutions. So when we ask for collaboration and partnership, networking is a part of the answer it is an important form of collaboration and partnership. So this panel brings together at least two questions of the Sendai framework, just to cite uh, item 28, B and E. First, Sendai framework says, to foster collaboration across global and regional mechanisms and institutions for the implementation and coherence of instruments and tools relevant to the disaster risk reduction. And secondly, to promote mutual learning and exchange of good practices of good practices. And that is one thing that we will try to do in this panel, namely to promote mutual learning and exchange of good practices and information. The order of the presentations of this panel goes from the global to the local, all in all. This order is in no way hi a hierarchy. Starting with the global level does not mean that it is more important. Nearly the contrary would be true. It is mainly the sub-regional and the local level but the disasters were dangerous and will be dangerous and devastating for people and for memory institutions. They have or would have the concrete experience of disasters. And this is the local memory institutions and the local people that have to be enabled to tackle disasters and to cope with their impacts. The five presenters of panel B are Mr. Max Skrivanek, Mr. Jamie Knight and myself. The three of us are present here in Paris. Mr. Daisuke Sato and Mr. Sultan Ali will give their presentation online. We will hear the presentations first, then we will have questions and answer. And now let us start, and let me begin myself with a presentation on behalf of the Memory Subcommittee on Education Research that I share. Okay, I'm the chair of the subcommittee on education and research, and that is a subcommittee of the International Advisory Committee for those of you which are not present here and are not so experienced. Now, this is a, a first slide has nothing to do with disaster. I hope for the next centuries, it's just an homage or greeting to the people of Japan and to the uh, Japanese uh, members of the organizing team. It shows a monument in my hometown where I live since four years, Cottbus, 100 kilometers southeast of Berlin. 
where in 1906 this uh, Japanese pavilion, Japanese tea house was built. The photo is an old document, a little bit later than 06, from the city archive. And you can ask yourself, uh, why did they build such a tea house? The experts in Germany say it's rather rare, uh, such a, a Japanese monument in G northern Germany. And why do they, did they do this? Probably because there was a, a big World Fairy Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1900, and there was a much bigger Japanese pavilion, but in the same way architectural. And probably the people from this provincial German town uh, did see it and liked it very much and such made a kind of, of uh, Small, smaller var variant of it. Now this is very important for me as a, as a person because it's 80 meters from where I live. I pass by nearly every day on my way to city center or to a train station. You can see even, um, you see the, the trunk on, the, on the, the tree in, in the background, there's a trunk. If you go up that trunk, behind the trees on the left, up there is a house lurking through on the left. And uh, that's where we live, exactly on the top of the house. Uh, and in winter, when the leaves have fallen down, uh, we can see this Japanese uh, tea house very well, so, so close. And I take this as a sign when in 1900, at such an event in Paris had such an impact, even in German provincial town, this event here in Paris in 2021 may have an impact on provinces all over the world. Okay, this presentation introduces very short some activities and plans and proposals of the Subcommittee on Education and Research concerning networking for disaster risk reduction, always related to documentary heritage. Please, thank you. Uh, first, A, uh, we have the Subcommittee has five members and no budget, so we really need the expertise of many other people, and we have a network of 70 of cooperating institutions and corresponding members. Uh, and. Present here at the moment are Ms. Julia Totolira Cervantes and Mr. Jonas Palm. Uh, and I thought Mr. Akira Matsuda would be here, but he would, was here online yesterday. This network could be strengthened by experts and institutions that work on disaster risk reduction here in the house uh, or in other parts of the world. We think of uh, not of students, but of professionals who have some experience on the field. But write me an email if you are interested in such a cooperation. Oh, no, sorry, back one, yeah. Now, next point is that we network by publications. That's very important, so we could uh, publish together with Akira Matsuda and the FX and Bender and Kenji Tamura two special issues of our newsletter. Can show them here, the only printed copies, one brochure and one catalog. I think that can be helpful for all of you that are interested in all of, with all of you, I mean really all people in the world, if you want to have these newsletters, together nearly 200 pages, you send an email to the most secretary or to me and you will get an electronic version because quite a number of presentations from this forum, uh, second forum, have a pre-version published already in, in these books and that could be a help for your work if you want to continue. Okay, thank you, yes. Then we have a regular newsletter, and that can include articles on disaster risk reduction. The next item in December will have an article by Roslyn Russell, our colleague in the committee, and chair of the Australian National Committee for Memory of the World. She writes a nice article on documenting disasters and records of disasters in the UNESCO Memory World Reg Register. And that could be a good start, a, a st platform to work on that. How can it be used? How can these quite a number of records on disaster in the International Register and perhaps uh, probably in the other registers as well. How can they be used for education and research? And that would be up to all of you that can see and hear us what you do with this article by Rosalind Russell. Other publications, it's okay. Other publications, for example, books could be possible too. And I mean, this is a simple sentence. I mean, we should think about real publication strategy for disaster risk reduction in memory of the world, documented heritage. See, what, was it already there? Quite a number. What could be used as a model? And was, what has to be done? What kind of publications do we need? And that would be really something that could uh, give some work for the future, but it could be very helpful. Okay, N next point, it could be, we have a number of 
Memory of World Knowledge Centers around the world. This one was created in Macau 2016. And future mem seven so far, quite a number in China, but in other countries like Cote d'Ivoire and uh, Mexico too, and uh, South Korea. So if we create further memory of World Knowledge Centers, could they have as one task disaster risk reduction? They could, we can discuss that. Now, um, we have quite a number of working groups. We have a working group Africa. My colleague Papa Mandiop has reported on that yesterday. So this is in a good way, good, good work. And, and I think we will have a success within the next two years for publication, I hope. Uh, we propose to explore the possibilities of creating a working group disaster risk reduction. Uh, preferably in a joint working group with a preservation subcommittee. We discussed this with Jonas Palm and with the chair of uh, that, Ms. Lai TV from Singapore. She was open and uh, we had some collaboration already together. And we propose to consider the creation of a working group medical documents. Could be on the main line of, of the program, speaking about old medical documents, very old, ancient, or uh, could be very modern one concerning the pandemics, Papa. Um, Fex and Banda already gave an insight into the activities of UNESCO concerning fighting the pandemics, archiving the pandemics, together with, with ICA, IFLA, ICOM, and others. But we could do one step further. Archiving the pandemics is one, one important thing. Fighting the pandemics could be something more proactive. Uh, and I could imagine that we had to, to bring together researchers of medicine, of biology, and so on, uh, and historians of med medicine, representatives of memory institutions, to see what do the researchers really need from the, from the memory institutions. It would be a completely different new step, a proactive way. Uh, I think it could be something very new, and that would show to the world once again how important uh, the program can be to the world. Now, short summary. A network of cooperating, uh, cooperating institutions corresponding manuals could be, could be enlarged. We could uh, strengthen the aspect of publications on disaster risk reduction, always together with partners. Future memory or knowledge centers may consider the task of disaster risk reductions. Uh, on the working groups, could be an important tool for that. Well, that's it for me. If you have interest in cooperating with us, wherever you are, Send me an email. You can find my email address on the on the bottom of the slide. Thank you for that. Uh, and concerning the, the next step, will be in this panel will be the presentation by Mr. Max Krivanek. He is now historian and archivist. He is the current national archivist of Curacao and vice president of the Caribbean branch of the International Council on Archives, which is in short CABICA. Max, please take the floor. Bon dia, Minister. Uh, thank you, Lothar. Thank you for moderating. Uh, bon dia, Minister. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fax and Banda, for organizing and his team organizing the sessions. And thank you, um, Ministry of J Japan, for helping organizing the sessions. Good morning, bonjour, konnichiwa. The Caribbean region is notorious. The Caribbean region is notorious, <clears throat> notorious for its natural hazards. We have hurricanes, volcanoes, and earthquakes. We have all of them this year. To begin with the fin St. Vincent volcano eruption in April, um, the Haiti earthquake on 7.2 on the Richter scale in uh, August this year, and Hurricane Ida in New Orleans, a category four on the Sapphire Simpson scale in August 29. This region is particularly vulnerable due to its archipelago, 
character is stretched. It has different jurisdictions, different languages, cultural backgrounds, historical, formal, and informal links with foreign nations. Connecting the region is extremely valuable for a sense of common Caribbean identity. Protecting its heritage is therefore an existential phenomenon. On top of its vulnerability comes the fact that often concerns small microstates. The entire national infrastructure can be wiped out uh, when an island fits in the eye of a storm. So, uh, creating a Caribbean network. Um, the initiative started in 2018. Um, 2018 uh, was the year after um, the, yeah, the the year after um, um, to the hurricane season 2017, which was a very active Atlantic hur hurricane season. It showed. Um, it, I skipped this due, due to uh, time um, issues. Um, the hurricane season 2017 was uh, very active with two category, category five hurricanes. Uh, as you can see, the tracks of Hurricane Irma particularly hit um, the islands of St. Martin and the BVI, the British Virgin Islands. Two weeks later, it was a category five Hurricane Maria also hit, this, it was a bit south of the Irma track and it was a full hit to the islands of Dominica and Puerto Rico. Hurricane Irma with St. Martin in the eye of the storm. This is a category five, which means it's a 252 kilometers per hour wind uh, scale. So where the first hurricane blew off away a lot of roofs, the second left an abundant amount of rain in the unprotected buildings, leaving the documentary heritage unprotected and ideal circumstances for moth growth in the documentary heritage on these islands. Um, a, an example is this on the BVI, the British Virgin Islands, a temporary storage completely ruined by Hurricane uh, Maria. Carbica took the initiative um, together with a lot of partners and among others UNESCO, SEDEMA, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, ICA, etc., to initiate a Caribbean network to better protect documentary heritage. But I must say it's not exclusively documentary heritage, it's also other forms of heritage that we try to protect. Um, I will focus in this example, on the, in this presentation, on the lessons learned, um, and I will follow up with the preparedness and response of our network in, to real threats in the Caribbean. Um, lessons learned, um, I will, f I will um, also um, follow up on the lessons learned in New Orleans, because 2018, um, New Orleans saw the um, Alliance for Response in New Orleans take into uh, action. Um, the lessons learned, learned alliances take time, but it's better said, alliances are work in progress. It never ends. It's always, you, know, you always need to focus on uh, uh, strengthening your institutional capacity and your personal human um, training and capacities. Um, lessons learned not, must not be lessons lost is an echo of yesterday's excellent presentation of Mr. Akira Matsuda, who said you have to uh, store, document your disasters um, in a, to enable to remember past disasters, uh, access a data to the disasters, and a disaster is never unprecedented. There's always a, a previous precedent. Um, as you know, in the, um, in the uh, instance of New Orleans, um, just three weeks ago it was hit by Hurricane uh, Ida, a Category 4 hurricane, uh, at exact the same day as Hurricane Katrina hit the city in 2005. The city is located on the worst possible uh, landfall for a hurricane because it's situated at the, at the uh, Delta of the Mississippi River. So as the hurricane 
pushes the seawater uh, a few meters up uh, uh, must, m uh, higher than normal, the Mississippi River doesn't have anything to go to. The water will breach the levees or overflow the levees with a result of um, a complete uh, um, flooded city. Um, between Katrina and Ida, the, the levee system was, uh, was um, improved. And here you see a picture of this improvement, and this is a, a good example of Build Back Better. So after Katrina, the um, city was flooded, but this picture that you see here is, could also be a picture of 1965. The city was flooded in 1965 as well. Um, so what happened to the documentary heritage? I give you two examples. The city's historical archives were stored in the flooded area of um, New Orleans. And as you can see in this picture, the, um, the, the archives were kept in the basement. So to everyone's surprise, these records were not flooded. They were kept dry, they were kept in good condition. And how, how came this about? Um, like I said, in the 1960s, there was a hurricane Betsy, and uh, the lessons learned from that hurricane was to build a, a repository that could withstand the flooding. So due to architectural design, the historical archives in 2005 were kept safe. Um, but um, the archivists were already in negotiation with the um, municipality to get these archives moved to another building due to capacity problems. And thank God that was not, um, that was not, that done not came about because the new building was not designed to withstand a flooding. Um, another example is um, the, um, the archives of the archdiocese in, um, in New Orleans. They were stretched over a larger area, not one repository, and they were flooded. And um, um, the, the restoring of these um, archives was a meticulous, meticulous process done by Emily Loomis, who was archivist of the um, archives, of Ar archdiocese archives. And she is now one of ICA's experts on disaster preparedness and she is advisor of our network. So um, after Katrina, the NOLA, this is the New Orleans, Louisiana area, established so-called AFR, an Alliance for Response. Um, yes, um, AFRs are a um, common um, phenomenon in, uh, the, in the United States. Um, they are work together to protect nat against natural disasters acro across the entire risk um, uh, spectrum. <clears throat> so in 2018, I had the opportunity to, um, to be present at the launch of the AFR, the Alliance for Response at, at uh, New Orleans, and to which would serve as a model for our own Caribbean network. So it's um, important to say that only in 2018 this came about, and it's only, that's just 13 years after the big disaster, 2005. So alliances take time, alliances are work in progress. That's what um, I like, that's my message for this presentation, even in the United States, where um, lots of, um, uh, means are available. Um, as a member of this, um, um, this is Emily Loomis, <coughs> picture of um, um, Emily Loomis taking um, a workshop in St. Martin in 2018. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so we held a START conference in St. Martin 2018 with Emily Loomis uh, doing workshops um, to, to, um, to our Caribbean um, people. <coughs> um, next slide is uh, <coughs> one of the outcomes, sorry, <coughs> one of the outcomes 
Yes, <laughs> thank you. One of the outcomes um, of this um, workshop was a preparedness workbook. <clears throat> so a year before Carbica had um, asked ICA to re re redirect funding from its archives at risk uh, program <clears throat> to establish a first aid recovery fund that would assist those regional repositories directed, directly affected by Irma and Maria. With these funds, a fact-finding mission was organized by, <clears throat> by our paper res restorer from the National Archives of Curso. So this is our paper um, restorer. This is Miss Valerie um, uh, Mo um, Martins Monnier. And she did a uh, damage and risk assessment and fact-finding mission on these islands. Um, this, um, this created a lot of goodwill and created the need for a permanent corporation and deploying experts from island to island. Yes. So, um, the... Uh, CHEN network, CHEN stands for the Caribbean Heritage, Heritage Emergency Network. It is a network. So it exists as a D-base, a D-base with experts um, who have volunteered to do preparedness, recovery and response missions in the Caribbean region and c communications is essential. After the devastating hurricanes, we just tried by trial and error to communicate with the islands uh, affected. And our uh, experience is that the internet is the most reliable way of communi communicating if, there, uh, the, if a disaster was struck. We noticed that some of our contact persons on the islands were uh, uh, posting pictures on Facebook. So we knew internet was available now and then. And this is logical because telephone cables uh, um, um, uh, so, uh, on the... Um, surface they were blown away by the by the hurricanes where internet uh, connections between the islands are submarine so they are not affected by the storm um, so we too have a um, um, a debase that will be online this year and we too are connected by whatsapp uh, the intention is to make expert staff available to other islands by a memorandum of agreement to formalize this process. The intention is to have that ratified by part, uh, participating countries more or less like the example, a model like the ex example of the AFR, the Alliance for Response in New Orleans. So, um, Yes, this year we had an entire different um, disaster, a volcano eruption in uh, St. Vincent. It was uh, La Soufrière volcano that erupted in April. And in cooperation with the uh, regional UNESCO headquarters in Jamaica, Carbica um, organized a DRA, a, uh, a disaster risk assessment on St. Vincent, which was online because due to COVID um, um, measures. Um, and this um, assessment will result in organizing an online workshop in November this year. Um, and this is for in particular interest for other islands with active volcanoes in, for example, Dominica, which has nine active volcanoes. So they use this um, findings in this uh, workshop for their uh, disaster preparedness plans. Um, Haiti. Haiti had an earthquake this year um, and we contacted our persons in Haiti. Their uh, archives were unaffected. Um, we did. Um, there is a danger, however, in Haiti and that's more or less um, the um, looting of objects. So uh, most of the churches in Haiti are... Um, are affected and there is a danger of looting objects from the churches and in this respect we I've uh, pres uh, you can see the um, the ID art app from Interpol 
which is a very uh, useful tool to um, register um, cultural objects. It will be uploaded to an, uh, a DBase of Interpol. Okay, the route ahead, um, strengthening our organizational basis. Um, Chen works closely with UNESCO and the attention is to work more closely with a heritage group like the uh, Caribbean Heritage Network um, and the well-organized Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, SEDEMA. Uh, Rita mentioned this in her pr presentation. Uh, we can um, uh, be part of their sub-organizations. Um, um, we also uh, reached out to the board of Blue Shield with the intention to uh, create some sort of Blue Shield network um, in the Caribbean region. Um, uh, an, another example of strengthening institutional cap capacity um, is was done by um, ICROM. Um, we've sent one of our um, Caribbean um, members to the Rome training of ICROM which is a train the trainer program. And um, in this respect, it, it, the idea of uh, Aparna, uh, uh, Aparna uh, Tendon yesterday in her presentation was very welcome um, because she proposed a global alliance for training for disaster management experts, which is very welcome for our region as well. So um, to conclude, um, Digitizing um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, heritage um, is, a, um, is, a, is an option. Um, Carbic has been working on the MEGAN program for several years. MEGAN stands for the Memory of the Islands Gateway for Archival Networking. Uh, it's a web portal that gives access to the archival resources in the Caribbean, and in its full achievement, it will connect all. Caribbean archival institutions in a common database and it will give access to digital archival contents and full descriptions of fonts and collections kept throughout the Caribbean. It already aims at providing a detailed directory of public Caribbean archives. This project is based on an intense collaboration among our Carbica members and adoption of the International Archival Description Standards, IZG, in its ICA's Access to Memory program. EDEPO is also a welcome um, um, way to protect heritage um, in the event of hurricanes, and there are pitfalls, but um, yesterday's keynote presentation of David Fricker was also helpful. The concept of data embassies will be uh, explored in our Caribbean region as well. So, um, this is to conclude um, my presentation. It is work in progress. Um, I think our uh, network will protect Caribbean heritage, valuable records, and um, we will work on strengthening our institutional basis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maximilian for your uh, for these insights into problems and solutions uh, for your region. It's a pleasure for me now to introduce Mr. Jamie Knight. He's responsible for the communication information sector in the UNESCO cluster office in San Jose, Costa Rica. This includes working for the mem implementation of the Member of the World program in Costa Rica, in Nicaragua, Panama, Honduras, and El Salvador. He was supervisor and will report on that on the launching of the Central American First Aid Volunteer Network for Documented Heritage, and his numerous other interests, like working for safety of journalists, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, which are also very important for this CI sector. Jamie, please take the microphone. Uh, good morning to everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Faxon and his team for giving me the opportunity to make a rather brief uh, presentation on the work that we have been doing in Central America with respect to uh, documentary heritage uh, and the documentary heritage and disaster risk uh, reduction. Uh, a few months ago, 
uh, in July of this year, we launched the Essential American First Aid um, Volunteers uh, uh, Network. And this network is a response, is a direct response um, to the needs of libraries and, and archives in the region as it relates to disaster risk reduction. Um, Central America is one of those regions which uh, is very much vulnerable uh, in the face of natural disasters or disasters, especially uh, floods and storms. And over the last few years, we have seen um, an increase in the intensity and frequency of these storms in the region. One of the main issues that all, well, many archives and uh, libraries face around the world is the issue of limited resources. And in many cases, libraries and archives do not have, uh, for example, computers, air conditioning, and in times of crisis, basic things like plastic bags to cover books or boxes, these resources uh, cannot be found. And this situation in terms of limited resources has been made worse by the COVID crisis because governments have had to cut, uh, have had to cut their, their budgets. So taking this into consideration, there are, two, there are various possible um, uh, routes that we could look at in, in terms of strengthening uh, the resilience of libraries and archives um, in times of, of, of crisis. And one of, the, one of those solutions is uh, the launching of volunteer networks. The other is working with communities, especially the communities where the libraries and archives are located. Now, the Libraries, uh, these volunteers can bring much needed support uh, to libraries and archives in times of crisis. A few months ago, I had a conversation with the director of one archive who mentioned to me that um, his archive has uh, a bodega or a room of around 75,000 documents which have yet to be classified and ordered. Um, if there is, for example, a crisis, a flood, uh, his team of 25 people would not, this team would not be sufficient to rescue and protect these, uh, these precious documents. And so therefore, it is important that we give consideration to launching volunteer networks that we could easily and quickly activate in times of crisis. So as I mentioned, this network was launched uh, in uh, July of this year in Panama. We're hoping to expand this network to uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Honduras over the next two, three, four, five years. And our hope is to train over a thousand volunteers in this specific region. Now, this network is going to be comprised or is comprised of national uh, teams. So the teams are not being coordinated by UNESCO. That is going to be the responsibility of the governments. Our central responsibility is to promote the initiative and to organize the training, um, the training programs. Now this network places emphasis on three things. Um, developing a culture of prevention, which is very, very important. Uh, we're also looking at the issue of responding to the disasters and the post disaster era. Now, there are many things that volunteers can do uh, which do not require them to, be, to receive training, for example, over a six-month period. There are very simple things that they can do, for example, for example, cleaning up after a flood. They can assist to, for example, document the damages after an earthquake. And taking that into consideration, it's very, very important that we engage young people. Someone, during one of the presentations yesterday, someone made a, a point about universities. I think universities are basically one of the most underutilized resources around the world. I have had the opportunity to speak to uh, departments of anthropology, history, and architecture, and the universities are excited, they, they are enthusiastic, and they're very much interested uh, in working with us uh, to develop this volunteer program um, in the region. Uh, I mentioned the issue of creating a culture of, 
prevention, which is very, very important. Very often we speak about responding to the disasters. It is equally important that we work with libraries, teams of students to, for example, assist the libraries in doing an analysis, analysis in terms of the areas that have to be addressed uh, to mitigate um, disasters. The second level of this program will involve us launching an international volunteers program. Now, there are volunteers all across the world. There are experts, uh, architects, people who have lots of experience who are willing to give of their time, for example, by Zoom, to offer uh, mentorship to offer solid advice to libraries and archives in times of crisis. And so that is going to be the second part of the, um, sort of the second part of this initiative, which we're hoping to launch uh, in uh, 2022. Let me see. Okay. So with respect to the launching of this initiative, we organize a few, uh, um, I keep thinking in Spanish, a few um, simulations <laughs> in Panama in July of this year, and we had the opportunity to train uh, 50 people across uh, four days, and of course we're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on uh, continuous and continual training over the next uh, six months. Another point which we have been putting focus on is really the importance of engaging communities. And I think that is one of the issues that we have not yet managed to fully embrace as part of the documentary heritage agenda. Now, in times of crisis, it, the, the communities may be the first responders. In a time of crisis where, for example, a bridge, um, a community is cut off because a bridge has been destroyed, and the firefighters cannot arrive on time, it is the communities that can help us secure and protect documentary heritage. In many communities, we have neighbor watch you know, or neighborhood watch programs. Um, it is important that documentary heritage be included in this program so they can, for example, secure or guard the building after an earthquake. Um, it is important that we, that we create a bond with these, with these institutions. Many, very often, uh, the people in the community do not even know that you know, this building is an archive or this building is a library. And it is important that we no longer have that distant relationship. It is very important that we cultivate that relationship so that uh, the people in the community can feel a sense, of, a sense of ownership. So one of the things that we have to look at from 2022 is, for example, organizing events, having people from the community come into libraries and archives to really get a sense of the importance of uh, documented heritage. Uh, in Central America, in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, there are at least you know, three, four, five million people. It is not hard to identify 200 people who are passionate about culture and heritage, people who are ready and willing to assist libraries and archives um, in times of disasters and crisis. And the last points I wish to make is that the issue of the volunteer networks uh, have to be placed within the context of a broader um, strate strategic approach as it relates to the protection and preservation of documentary heritage. And this is going to require the development of national plans focused on documentary heritage and disaster risk reduction. Uh, one of the things that we don't do as, as often as we should uh, is to establish uh, uh, mechanisms through which we have regular dialogue between stakeholders. One of the very interesting things we learned during the simulations in Panama is that even though many institutions have fire extinguishers, we assume that everybody knows how to use a fire extinguisher and that's not necessarily the case. And so it is important that we have these dialogues between the Red Cross, the Ministry of Culture, the universities, to promote not just the sharing of best practice, practices, but to also promote the development of, of, of uh, policies and solutions to address these specific, um, uh, these specific challenges. Uh, yesterday, someone made an, uh, a point about training, there has to be a focus on continuous training, and that training has to be 
not just be delivered through a workshop here, a workshop there, but through a long-term and strategic, uh, strategic plan. And lastly, in 2022, we're going to be launching the Central American Network of uh, or youth network on the, uh, on the preservation of documented heritage. And our intention is to work with universities, to work with young people, so that they can generate um, creative and innovative ideas and, proje um, pro and projects related to uh, not just uh, the preservation of documented heritage, but access to heritage. Very often we forget that word, accessibility. Having the documents in the library or the archives, that is not sufficient, especially in this era of TikTok and Instagram. It is, it is very important that we engage young people so that this information uh, becomes useful, useful uh, to them. And so th that is basically uh, a, 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 an overview or summary of what we have been focusing on so far. And what we have seen, what we have learned so far is there is a lot of enthusiasm. I have been with UNESCO for about 10 years, and one of the things that I have discovered is very often people are willing to partner with us, but they're just waiting for someone to say, do you wanna work with us? Very often things don't get done, not because there isn't interest, but nobody says, do you wanna work with me? And I think it's gonna be very important within the context of this conversation with respect to networking that we engage universities, that we engage young people. There are several routes, establish new uh, networks of volunteers or work with, for example, the Red Cross to create um, so sort of specialized teams of volunteers. I've spoken to the Red Cross in various countries and they said to me, Jamian, we never really but we hadn't put a lot of emphasis on documentary heritage and culture before, but we are interested in working with UNESCO to establish specialist teams uh, focused on um, documentary heritage and preservation of heritage. And lastly, working through working with universities, they could ensure that students, as students, for example, in the humanities, as part of their graduation requirements, that they do a project working with, unit, with archives and libraries focus on documentary heritage and creating um, resilience and creating um, a culture of prevention. Thank you very much for your attention. Mr. Knight, thank you very much for your wonderful and concise presentation. I especially remember the your plead and your initiatives to work with young people, with volunteers, and the work f by communities, for communities, just to highlight two aspects of your um, presentation. Now, after we've heard three presentations from here in Paris, we will go over to two colleagues which present online. And the first one is Mr. Sato, Daisuke da da um, Sato, sorry? Hello. Uh, hello. Oh, there you are. Sorry. No. <laughs> uh, for, I see myself, but I much, uh, much more would like to see you indeed. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, he's uh, well. He's not here, but he's uh, there. <laughs> In an, now, Mr. Dasuke Sato is a prof associate professor of the internet at the International Research Institution of Disaster Science at Tohoku University in Japan. He is an expert in Japanese history and also works actively for the preservation of historical documents. He has a great research uh, experience in Miyagi, which had been affected by a number of natural disasters, and he investigates the relationship between modern society, natural disasters, and the preservation of cultural heritage. Um, I have to make one further, further remark. Um, his presentation was written in Japan, and it will be read, read out loud from a manuscript that was translated into English beforehand by Mr. John D'Americo from Yale University in the United States of America. So this is just for explanation that the presentation has a little bit different form than the other ones. Um, if we come to a discussion later on, if there are any questions, 
Mr. D'Amico in the United States will translate the questions into Japanese for Mr. Sato, uh, and he will answer. But a little bit more complicated, but just to explain to you uh, beforehand how questions and answers would be handled in his case. Mr. Sato, I'm really looking forward to hear your presentation. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Sato Daisuke. I am associate professor at Tohoku University uh, and the vice president of the Miami Shio Network. Thank you for giving me opportunity to present here for second time since December 2018. I would like to express my deep appreciation and gratitude to all the staff whose efforts make this forum possible under the current circumstances. Uh, today, I would like to present on the current state of volunteer run document rescue effort in the regions affected by the earthquake, tsunami, and the nuclear disaster of March 11, 2011. Because of the constraints, I will only be discussing initiatives in Miami Prefecture, where I have been direct, uh, directly involved in document preservation, and in Fukushima Prefecture, which was the site of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. In my previous presentation at UNESCO, which can find in the newsletter, I discussed the current state of local historical document preservation uh, in Japan. Since that forms the key background to my talk today, I will briefly review some of the main points I made at that time. First, there are over 2 billion extant historical documents from the late 16th through 19th centuries in Japan. Their existence reflects the high literacy of Japan society in the past and is in and of itself an important cultural heritage of humanity. Second, most of these documents are kept and maintained by private owners. Third, while these documents continue to be lost even under normal conditions, natural disasters in particular threaten to cause the sudden and immediate loss of historical heritage. Fourth, the main group responsible for the rescue and preservation of these historical documents are the volunteer Shiro networks founded in the aftermath of the January 70th, 1995 Hansen earthquake. I joined the Miami Shiro network, which was established after the 2003 earthquake in Miami Prefecture. Based out of the city of Sendai, the activities of the network continue to this day. The March 11 disaster was the largest ever experienced by the Miyagi Shirio network. The network rescued 83 privately held collections, totaling over 100,000 individual documents. Over the past 10 years, we have dried, cleaned, and digitally photographed all the documents in the 32 of these 83 collections, 38% of the total. In other words, even 10 years after the disaster, we are still unable to return 62% of the documents collections to the original owners. The time needed to restore severely damaged to a deteriorated document and to create finding aid essential to the use of these materials by the public. The scarce availability of the highly specialized staff needed to the preservation work and the difficulty of scaling funding to sponsor costly restoration efforts are just some uh, of the many reasons for the slow progress. At the same time, basic preservation tasks are largely done with the support of citizen volunteers. Since the start of recorded preservation effort in June 9, uh, 2011 until the end of 2020, around 8,044 people have worked a total of 851 days to help the Miyagi Shiro network. 5,614 of the volunteers are ordinary citizens, mainly women and the elderly. Having built up a great deal of experience over the past 10 years, these volunteers have mastered preservation techniques and have taken up a key role in the process of protecting local historical documents. They are now essential to our, our preservation effort. Over the past 10 years, large-scale natural disasters have continued to cause severe damage across Japan. In response, the serial networks based at universities in the regions afflicted by these disasters 
have conducted document rescue and preservation effort. To give a few examples, following the uh, 2016 Kumamoto earthquake, some 47 collections with over 30, 39,000 documents were recovered uh, by the local serial network. While after the 2018 flooding in Ehime Prefecture, five collections numbering over 20,000 documents were saved. The Miyagi Shirio Network managed to preserve another nine collections containing over 60,000 documents in the aftermath of the 2019 typhoon Hagibis. Over the course of this series of disasters, the various Shirio Network have worked in cooperation with each other to uh, rescue and preserve documents, funding, material, and method uh, which were systematically developed after the Great East Japan earthquake for the emergency handling of large number of documents in the aftermath of tsunamis and flooding have been brought to bear, resulting in the successful preservation of many documents. Progress continues on efforts to meaningfully situate the use of historical documents within contemporary society and through doing so, recover the history of local communities. The Miyagi Shirio Network has published a book based on historical documents and written for a general audience on the history of daily life in the regions affected by tsunami and other disasters. From 2070 to 80, we held five lectures on this book in Ishinomaki, a city severely affected by tsunami. I would like to introduce some of the survey response from the audience of these lectures. One participant said, learning about local history is a great resource for thinking about the restoration and revival of our community after disaster. It was a wonderful lecture. Another response, it was amazing to hear the stories of the prior residents of our hometown, our ancestors who are now gone forever and will not return again. That someone is remembering them makes me very happy. This suggests that for those affected by disaster, knowing their history is not just important for the rebuilding and revival of their hometowns, but also is of profound significance for passing down the memory and history of their community to future generations so that it will not be forgotten. Early effort in the coastal regions of Fukushima was severely limited as the prefecture was experiencing the impact of, of an unprecedented nuclear disaster. In spite of this, the local government, Fukushima University, Ibaragi University, and Tsukuba University, and Dr. Nishintaro Nishimura uh, have continued to collaborate on recovery of documents damaged by the disaster and the preservation of historical materials related to the societal impact of, uh, of and the response to the March 11 triple disaster. In the town of Tomioka, 22, uh, 12 kilometers south of Fukushima Daiichi, the entire population had to evacuate due to the nuclear disaster. Since 2014, with the support of researchers and students at Fukushima University, the collection of historical documents recovered after the disaster and of records telling the story of the town since that fateful day on March 11 has continued. On July 11, 2021, an archive was opened in Tomioka for the preservation, display, and research of the over if 50,000 historical documents that have been collected. At present, the residents of Tomioka number only 1,200, some 10% of the pre-disaster population. In the two months since its opening, however, the archive has welcomed over 5,000 visitors. 75 of the uh, 50,000 objects held within the archive were rescued through the work of volunteers after the nuclear disaster. Natural history objects, archaeological materials, and historical documents from the classical period in Japan up to March 2011 make up 60% of the objects on display. 
The archive is by no means just a memorial to disaster. Rather, March 11 is put into context as only one part of the longer history of Tomioka. The captions that explain each of the objects on display are accompanied by relevant expect, ex, 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 excerpt from interviews with residents of the town. In this way, the, the exhibit reconstructs everyday life in Tomioka through a combination of both rescued documentary heritage and recorded memory. The exhibit serves as a reminder of what the town's people have lost due to the March 11 disasters. In 19,000, some 1,500 uh, 1, uh, sakura trees were planted in the Yonomori district of Tomioka. The forest was long beloved by many residents. In the July 12th uh, edition of the newspaper Fukushima Minpo, a former resident spoke of their thoughts on seeing a picture of the sakura from 19 years ago. Seeing an image of the sakura from the early Showa period, I was deeply moved. The sight of the great crowds of people having fun looking at the flowers reminded me of how beloved those trees have been since long ago. It would be great if the archive became a place for evacuated town residents to deepen their ties to one another while enjoying the old photographs. In this way, the archive at Tomioka, as a site for the exploration of history and memory, serves as a place for the restoration of local identity and the rebuilding of bonds between town's residents. Anyone who is trying to think of ways of using documental heritage in order to support people affected by disaster should go Tomioka, Fukushima. In Japan, it is the best example of the use of documental heritage for this purpose. In the December 2018 presentation at UNESCO, I introduced historical recovery effort in Japan as a practical application of the concept of psychosocial support. I argued that by restoring and creating new social relationship, historical recovery and restoration effort help encourage the widespread, self-directed rehabilitation of individuals, groups, and communities. Since then, the historian John Morris had noted that the recovery of historical material and the reconstruction of the history of disaster-affected region is essential for the rehabilitation and maintenance of the mental health of those afflicted by disasters. This suggests that historical recovery work will help form the basis for dealing with many current issues. Testimon a testimonial from people affected by disasters suggests that these activities are not just about protecting the uh, physical thing that is documentary heritage itself, but rather have a meaning in connection to the rehabilitation of individuals and their communities, serving as a form of psychosocial support. That being said, there are still only very few examples of the disaster relief focusing on the preservation of documentary heritage in Japan. Current efforts depend on the enthusiasm and willpower of volunteers, as, uh, several scholars, and several uh, uh, public servants. Uh, this has not changed in the 10 years since March 11. Sadly, this is evidence of how little documentary heritage is valued in Japan. Still, the past 10 years has also seen the rise of a young generation with experience of documentary heritage preservation from their time in university. Many are active on the ground in preservation work today. Perhaps this could be said to be one point of hope to emerge from the aftermath of the March 11 disaster. Finally, I would like to talk about something I touched on in my 2018 presentation, the historical document from Ishinomaki, destroyed by 2011 tsunami. Only the photographs of these documents survived. 
Later, they were burned into an album and returned to their home in Ishinomaki, where in May 2021, the library was finally rebuilt. There, the photographs are stored and are now being deciphered by local residents. The many archival tags and rivals speak to the passion and excitement those who experience disaster have for the work of historical preservation. Without a doubt, the links that bind past to present are being made strong. Thank you very much. Mr. Sato, much, many thanks for your presentation. Uh, your region, Japan, was in the focus of the of the world at latest since the tsunami you, you, report, the, you reported about and its devastating impact. And it's really good to see how good progress you make in research, so which may avoid devastating impacts at least for the future. Now let's go to another part of the world that is to Pakistan. Let me introduce uh, Mr. Sultan Ali. He graduated from the National College of Arts and he is involved with projects focusing on tangible and intangible heritage, digital and physical archives and history. He is an initiator of the Mountain Heritage Archives and very interesting project he will report us about and I'm eager to learn about the problems he finds in Pakistan and solutions he proposes. Mr. Sultan Ali, please. Thank you, Lothar. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm very thankful to UNESCO for giving me uh, this opportunity to be a part of the second Global Memory of the World uh, uh, Forum. My name is Sultan Ali. I am an oral historian a and a digital archivist uh, from Pakistan. I am the founder of the Mountain Heritage Archives, a digital archive that focuses on the history and heritage of the northern mountain region of Pakistan, a secluded region. Uh, as an archivist, I have frequently come across valuable, vulnerable, and endangered private and public archives and collections, which include manuscripts, Mughal edicts, traditional family trees, miniature paintings, letters, British colonial records, uh, rare books, photographs, audio recordings, and films. Some of them, if nominated, could make it to the UNESCO's Memory of the World International Register. My presentation today briefly highlights some of the most apparent risks faced by documentary heritage in Pakistan, which need to be addressed on a priority basis. Pakistan does not have the infrastructure, a vigilant legislative uh, system, the political will, and the economic and human resources required to document, protect, and preserve the country's documentary heritage. In Pakistan, there is a huge gap between uh, the memory and academic institutions, and the memory institutions have rarely been a priority. Documentary heritage as a distinct type of heritage does not get as much atten attention as tangible and intangible heritage do. A thorough investigation is needed to fully identify and understand the risks faced by documentary heritage and how disasters and risks faced by documentary heritage can be managed and prevented in the future. Uh, now, I'll proceed to my presentation. Can you see my screen? So, status of documentary heritage in Pakistan. I'll briefly go over uh, some of the important features of Pakistan's heritage. Pakistan is a new country in an ancient land where civilizations like the Indus Valley and Mehrgad flourished. Historic trade and religious routes passing through the region connected Persia, Central Asia, and India in the past. Different religions have coexisted in this land. Gilgit manuscripts, some of the oldest Buddhist manuscripts were discovered in Gilgit in the 1930s. Sikh religion was born here. The country's 220 million people speak more than 70 languages. These plain facts demonstrate the country's history of production, 
and consumption of knowledge. So the knowledge produced, consumed, and transferred from one generation to another has to be protected by memory institutions. For financial and political reasons, memory institutions are not a priority in Pakistan, and memory institutions have not been able to protect uh, or preserve documentary heritage in Pakistan. The nominal resources allocated for heritage as Pakistan uh, is a economically a struggling country are invested mostly in tangible and intangible heritage and almost none on safeguarding documentary heritage. Documentary heritage is not a priority. Tangible and intangible heritage are a, a priority. For the lack of resources, weaker laws, absence of policies, and because of a conventional bureaucratic system in place, uh, the country is far from identifying, listing, digitizing, and preserving its documentary heritage, and even farther from making it universally accessible. Here is an example uh, of uh, one such example. You can see a picture of the royal copy of Tuski Jahangiri, uh, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir's handwritten autobiography in Persian in a private collection in Pakistan. They must have produced several copies uh, of this uh, autobiography, but this is the royal copy uh, that was kept in the royal family for several generations. Risks faced by documentary heritage in Pakistan. So here are some of the most apparent uh, and obvious risks faced by documentary heritage in Pakistan at the moment. Uh, there are no studies, no surveys, no data available on uh, these risks and how the country uh, or its memory institutions have managed to uh, manage these risks in the past. There is no such uh, re research or data on, on these. Risks faced by documentary heritage cast by nature and men have hardly been identified. Memory institutions need to understand and define documentary heritage bef before identifying and mitigating the risks. They have hardly identified a uh, documentary heritage as a distinct category of uh, heritage. As I said earlier, uh, we have mostly been focusing on documentary heritage, uh, on uh, tangible or built heritage. And intangible heritage or documentary heritage have not been the priorities. Memory institutions need to be proactive and reach out to people and communities to identify valuable and vulnerable collections. Memory institutions do not have the resources to focus on rural areas. 60% of the population, 220 million people, is rural. The institutions, both public and private, need to expand beyond urban centers. There are three or four large cities in Pakistan, Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad. Most of these public or private initiatives are based in these large cities. They don't operate or they don't have local chapters in uh, small towns or in the vast uh, uh, rural uh, areas of the country. Earthquakes have frequently hit the country in the past. During such disasters, damage done to built heritage is readily identified and reported, but the damage done to documentary heritage goes unnoticed. No reports are available on uh, the damage done to documentary heritage during uh, recent major earthquakes. There is no data available on uh, what we have last, lost in terms of documentary heritage in the last devastating earthquake that was in 2005. Uh, here is an image of an undated Pahari style miniature painting uh, from a set of 17 similar paintings kept in unfavorable conditions with other valuable records in a private library in Pakistan that I came across. And then there are periodic floods during monsoon in the country. In 2010, during such floods, one fifth of the country's land was submerged in water. No surveys have been carried out to a certain damage done to documentary heritage by such floods. In the past, I have come across people <coughs> who had important collections or records or archives that were destroyed by floods, but there is no record, there is no data available on what we have lost in these, in such floods. And then uh, since the 1980s, uh, these uh, sectarian or religious conflicts have intensified 
and uh, sectarian conflicts have kept flaring in the country since the 1980s. During sectarian conflicts, religious places have frequently been targeted and attacked, where important religious books, records, and manuscripts are kept. How sectarian and religious conflicts have affected the documentary heritage of Pakistan has never been investigated. There, are, there is no data, no research, no uh, academic research on what we have lost in these sectarian conflicts across the country. Memory institutions are yet to map the damage done to documentary heritage by war on terror post 9-11 and the resulting internal mass migrations. All these things, conflicts, uh, uh, floods, uh, earthquakes, large development projects uh, like dams have uh, displaced communities and uh, what uh, we have lost during such uh, internal mass migrations are displacements, we don't know. And then there is climate change. Climate change will affect the already under-resourced documentary heritage in many ways, directly and indirectly in Pakistan. Uh, when it comes to climate change, Pakistan is one of the most uh, vulnerable countries, and we don't know. We don't have a map, we don't have a policy, how we are going to save uh, the country's uh, documentary heritage when climate change hits the country in several different ways at different levels. During the COVID-19 pandemic, unpreserved documentary heritage has more chances, I believe, of being irreversibly damaged. The resources are relocated to more urgent sectors. It, that, as that has been done around the globe, the situation will have lasting impacts on all types of heritage and especially documentary heritage in Pakistan. A roadmap needs to be drafted to preserve the country's documentary heritage. Existing memory institutions need to digitize and make their collections universally accessible using modern technologies, build models that encourage researchers and their audiences. Memory institutions, public memory, memory institutions in Pakistan have been doing the opposite. They must have digitized some of their collections, but they are not easily available or accessible on the internet. And Pakistan does not have inventories on documentary heritage. Need to develop inventories. In the absence of inventories, no one can tell what documentary heritage was lost during the floods of 2010, the earthquake of 2005, and the internal mass migrations triggered by sectarian conflicts and war on terror. Not knowing what was lost or could be lost is the most serious threat. So we urgently need to develop inventories in provinces or at the national level. Establishing a national register is important to safeguard documentary heritage from potential risks and hazards. So Pakistan does not have a national register of documentary heritage. It is time we develop a national register with its provincial or local chapters. Lack of, their lack of academic courses, trained professionals in the field, and long-term collaborations between academic and memory institutions. Time, it's time to develop such collaborations and build networks to save documentary heritage in the country. There is no such central or local or provincial platform where public and private uh, institutions working to save documentary heritage could come together. So in the absence uh, of uh, public uh, memory institutions uh, supported by the state or the country, uh, in the past few years, uh, they ha people have started the local communities have started uh, many initiatives that are working towards preserving and protecting documentary and intangible heritage. Mountain Heritage Archives is one such example. Mountain Heritage Archives is one of the many community-based initiatives working to preserve documentary and intangible heritage in Pakistan. But as I said earlier, most such initiatives are based in large cities. They are not able to uh, penetrate into rural areas. And we don't know, uh, we don't have a clear picture of what is there in terms of documentary heritage in rural Pakistan. So it is one such initiative that is working in the northern mountain region of Pakistan, which is rural and uh, is focusing on Gilgit Baltistan, 
the northernmost region of Pakistan, where climate change, internal migration, sectarian violence, and the absence of memory institutions. There are no memory institutions in this region have made documentary heritage even more vulnerable compared to other provinces uh, of the country. The initiative aims to build a digital repository of manuscripts, rare books, photographs, oral histories. Most of the languages spoken in, the, in this region where we are focusing right now are endangered. Folklore, audiovisual records, and environmental sounds. The initiative will expand to, in future, we are planning to expand to Chitral, Kashmir, Ladakh, and Pamir in, uh, to celebrate the common heritage. Some of these areas are not in Pakistan. They are in India, they are in China, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan, which have a, uh, we, who share a rich past and heritage. The main objective of Mountain Heritage Archives is to digitize such valuable and vulnerable collections, which we talked about earlier, and I'll show you a few examples and make them accessible through the internet and other possible means by involving local communities. The project will also explore other digital venues like apes, 360 degree videos, virtual uh, uh, reality, uh, uh, virtual uh, tours, audiobooks, digital exhibitions, while collaborating with other institutions, both academic and memory institutions. This will help people see documentary heritage in a new light in Pakistan and in Gilgit, Baltistan. Mountain Heritage Archives is a catalyst encouraging local institutions, educationists, policy makers, and corporations to understand the importance of documentary heritage. Involvement of these local entities, we believe, will help make documentary heritage accessible to local and global communities using modern technologies. Here is an example of what we have been coming across. Here is an old Divane Shamsi Tabrizi, an important volume of Rumi's poetry in the possession of Khalifa Durya Maknun, who is in his late 80s in the village of Sher Kilag in Gilgit, Baltistan. The book weighs several kilos uh, and was brought from Lucknow in India before partition to Gilgit, Baltistan more than 100 years ago. Here is another example of such vulnerable collections which we have identified and digitized. A handwritten copy of an old Persian book from Honza. The handwritten copy was produced in the 1950s. We don't have the resources and means to preserve them physically. And here is another example how we have been using uh, the digital archive. Here is an exhibit prepared by the Mountain Heritage Archives titled uh, Valleys of Nostalgia, Letters from Honza, a reproduction of two letters of Mir Muhammad Jamal Khan, the last ruler of Hunza, written in the 1960s and 70s, and two old black and white pho uh, photographs from Shimshal uh, in Hunza. It was a part of a larger exhibition that was held in Lahore in Pakistan and Jaipur in India in January 2020, just before the COVID-19 hit. We believe private initiatives like these can convince the uh, civil society civil society, acad academic and memory institutions, corporations, and government bodies to come together to address uh, risks faced by documentary heritage. In the coming years, we also believe that in the coming years, the informed public opinion on heritage can play an important role in developing a culture that would help prioritize the protection of heritage. Thank you. If you, if you have uh, any questions, please email me. Thank you. Mr. Sultan Ali, thank you very much for your insight into the situation of document heritage and disaster risk in, in Pakistan and your initiative uh, that, you, that you promote for us and for the Memory World program. So now, thank you, all panelists. We can come over to the question and answer session. I think the tradition is that we first ask the colleagues here in the room, do you have any questions to the panelists? and the presenters online. Well, you are please. You are uh, Cervantes. <laughs> Thank you, sorry that I... 
I have one question in English, another in Spanish. In case of the volunteer networks in Central America and Japan, do you formalize a registry of volunteers? Do you register in advance the hours, days, or weeks that each volunteer could offer to help? This, that's one question. Y, y la otra. And the second question in Spanish. I believe that uh, on the issue of research and the link with uh, memory of the world, we could perhaps think about promoting as uh, open sources uh, information and doc documentation on disasters, the same thing as what is done with human rights in order to promote uh, research and free use of copyright for studies and research. And this could also perhaps even apply to the pandemic uh, rather than for a commercial use. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, with respect to the, the volunteer network, it's important to mention that it's a highly decentralized network. And that means that the ministries of culture or the libraries and the archives are responsible for its implementation. And so therefore, uh, there, I think the ideal thing is to have volunteers working with the libraries and archives over a long period of time in a way that people volunteer with the Red Cross. Um, they, but in this case, volunteers may sign an agreement for maybe 40 hours with a library. It may be six months. Uh, the library, for example, can have a formal arrangement with the university through which they can identify students as part of their programs to do an internship with the, with the, with the library and archives. And lastly, just to go back to the point of the issue of um, prevention, we are hoping to work with universities and the archives so that students as part of their programs can come up with creative and innovative uh, projects that can be implemented along with the archives and, and libraries focused on um, uh, um, developing a culture of resilience and, and prevention. Sumi informed me that some questions have come to us uh, online and I'm eager looking to hear them. That's up. right. I wanted to bring in two questions that had been entered into our chat <laughs> during the course of this panel session. And thank you to the participants for, for bringing these questions to us. First is a question from Mojde Mohamedi, who asks, data and information sharing between countries is key to effectively manage disasters. How do we handle this challenge? Perhaps, Max, this is something, because you do share, share and collaborate with archives in other countries, is something you could touch upon. Well, it touches upon the uh, keynote speech of uh, David Fricker, um, who mentions a, a very um, attractive idea of um, uh, data centers, but the, the uh, concept of data embassies. So you have uh, sovereignty of your own data. Um, the data center in another country will be um, will be will be will be like an embassy. So you have uh, protection uh, of international law on your sovereignty, and, and that is uh, interesting because um, you know um, most hosting uh, opportunities are in Europe or um, the United States, and uh, they, due to data protection acts, uh, for example, in the Caribbean region. Um, hosting opportunities will be most likely in Europe. Uh, but Europe has a uh, open data policy, so there is free reuse of uh, digital data, and so th that means um, uh, digitized Caribbean heritage will be in the jurisdiction of European countries. And this idea of an um, of a data embassy will, will uh, 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 give us sovereignty. Of, of our own data. That, that is a, a great answer to that. The data embassy was indeed a really important proposal from day one. Perhaps to follow up on that, there is another question from Huyun Tran Hui who asks, how should we develop management policies for digitizing the documentary heritage to prevent data theft and destruction in cyberspace? It's a difficult question indeed. <laughs> it's a difficult question. 
but I guess it will be managed by license agreements. So before you um, will uh, go into a um, agreement to host uh, your data in a central, you have to um, you have to seal it with a uh, with a, a viable uh, license agreement. Okay, so preventively uh, assure that cyber attacks don't become an issue. There is one further question to Mr. Sultan Ali uh, in Pakistan. A, a user, or excuse me, a participant from our audience has asked, what are the biblical floods of 2010 mentioned in your presentation? Mr. Ali, if you can hear that question. I think you're still on mute, Mr. Ali. Yes, I have already answered it in text. They were very large scale and devastating. That's why I referred to them as biblical floods. Okay, thank you for that concise answer. Those were the questions from our chat. Okay, fine. We nearly made one, we one o'clock. That's a good time to end. Uh, thank you for to my colleagues on the panel and online for the presentations. I hope that can give some input for that Mr. Chris, uh, Faxon Bender asked this morning when he asked for the development of a strategic frame for this matters in connection with memory of the world and I think these presentations could help perhaps. Um, my th still always interesting to see and sad to hear that the resources and the budget in some parts of the world like Pakistan and uh, and Central America, Mr. Damien Knight spoke about, are still so low, and I think it should be a, a part of the strategic frame, probably, that the situ financial situation in different parts of the world is quite different, and how that can be tackled by the, by the frame, perhaps, or by that the, what the frame can propose. Now, thanks to the organizational team, Jackson Bender and his team, to the moderator, Sumi, and the colleagues, all that helped to make this a success. It's a hybrid format. I found it very successful so far. And thanks to the interpreters for their difficult and very important work. I really look up to them. And now let's go to lunch, or to breakfast, or to dinner, or to bed, depending on the time zone you live in. And we see each other back again here in Paris. Uh, Paris time, 2.30 p.m. for the panel C. See you later.
Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good break again. And uh, for all of you on the stream, thank you for remaining with us. It's great to see so many uh, participants still with us on the stream for this very final portion uh, of this Global Policy Forum. We are moving now into, as I said, the, the final panel discussion. What we've seen already today is looking at understanding disaster risk management and disaster risk reduction for resilience. We've looked at the power of networks, and now we're looking at a key step forward. So in this final discussion, we'll look at uh, new challenges and the proactive role of documentary heritage. This is about improving emergency preparedness, ensuring a better disaster response in the future by networking and, and leveraging those networks that we discussed in, in the previous session. And it's about building back better because indeed disasters with all of the challenges that they pose can also provide something of a silver lining. Uh, the ability to create new workflows uh, and practices and put those practices into, into place to allow for a better reaction in the future. So I would like to invite you again in this final session to interact with us, either here in the room or in our chat in our question and answer um, function in the chat to make sure that you send us any questions you have for our panelists. I would like to introduce our panelists now as we continue. Uh, joining us here in our room is Mr. Jonas Palm. He's a member of UNESCO Memory of the World team, having served on the IAC, the International Advisory Committee and the Preservation Subcommittee. And he will present to us about storing and preserving information about nuclear waste depositories as disaster prevention. Sitting next to him is Mr. Dietrich Schüller. He was with the Memory of the World program almost since its beginning and is presently a, a member of the International Advisory Com Com uh, Committee, excuse me, and Preservation Subcommittee. And he will tell us about the Magnetic Tape Alert project and how that work is completing the picture of highly endangered original documents. We have two guests joining us online. First, Ms. Lai Tefang. She is the chair of the Preservation Subcommittee and uh, she will be telling us about the proactive role that can be played in preserving documentary heritage, so a key theme of this session. And last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Hiroaki Shimizu uh, joining us from the Japan Broadcasting Corpor Corporation, so a member uh, of the media indeed, and he's operating a website called NHK Great East Japan Earthquake Archives, something he will be sharing with us. And our expert for facilitator for the session is, of course, the Chief of Documentary Heritage Unit at UNESCO, Mr. Faxon Banda. So I would like to hand uh, over now to you, Mr. Banda. So um, thank you very much for uh, joining us again for this afternoon. Um, and thank you, Sumi, for that introduction, which makes uh, my work uh, much easier. So mine is, is to ensure that the speakers um, uh, speak as briefly as possible in order to facilitate um, uh, some conversation later on, uh, not only with the, the participants that are here on site, but also with all of you that are, are online. Um, uh, of course, uh, you can use the chat to uh, raise uh, questions. Um, I have also um, uh, uh, shared with the speakers uh, some questions in advance of their delivery, um, and hopefully uh, some of them might even touch on the various aspects of the questions that I ask, um, so that uh, the need for raising those questions publicly may be uh, uh, may be gotten rid of. But if not, uh, I will get back to those questions. Um, uh, and perhaps for the, for the, for the uh, participants, it is important for me to, uh, to signal those questions so that as you follow the delivery of uh, the presentations, uh, you have already at the back of your minds uh, uh, what I, uh, as, as moderator, uh, am thinking about. Uh, I will be asking uh, of uh, uh, Ms. Lai T. Fang, who will be uh, our first uh, presenter, and she will be joining us virtually. I'll be asking of her uh, to say something with respect 
to the magnetic, magnetic tape project, which uh, uh, Mr. Diedrich Schuller will also speak to in his presentation. And that question will also apply uh, to him. Uh, my main concern with their presentations as they've been given to me uh, is that uh, they seem to focus more on governmental and or intergovernmental action to support the preservation of magnetic tapes as old media formats. And my question to them is how can we engage the private sector, especially in developed countries, to support uh, their efforts before the 2025 deadline. You need to mark that because it will be raised in one of the presentations. So with that teaser, uh, I would like to uh, hand over now to Ms. Lai T. Fang to proceed uh, with her presentation. Thank you, Faxon. Uh, let me share my PowerPoint presentation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. It is my honor and pleasure to be with you this afternoon to share my thoughts on the new challenges in the preservation of documentary heritage. During the past two days, you have heard much about the 2015 UNESCO recommendation concerning the preservation of and access to documentary heritage, including in digital form. You have also heard about the importance of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction from various speakers. This presentation will discuss the new challenges in the preservation of documentary heritage posed by COVID-19 pandemic, the increasing popularity of new media and global efforts in the digitization of at-risk magnetic tapes. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected preservation work? You have heard from Ms. Apana Tandon of ICROM yesterday, how COVID has affected the preservation of cultural property. Let me share some concerns on the impact of COVID on the preservation of documentary heritage. Do you get a sense of deja vu looking at the news report on the left? Unfortunately, the news is still current in New Zealand and Vietnam. Some countries have also just exited lockdown. The image on the right shows which groups are at higher risk and suffer more severe symptoms from COVID. What would these have to do with the preservation of documentary heritage? COVID-19 has unleashed a variety of challenges in the work of memory institutions, notably in the prevention of physical access to their collections and services, particularly during the early phases of the pandemic. Fortunately, this was mitigated with digitalization and digitization initiatives undertaken by the memory institutions. One of the key impacts of COVID is the reprioritization of national resources, which could have left memory institutions underfunded at a critical time when it is essential to create a detailed and comprehensive record of the worldwide experiences and international efforts with the pandemic. Lockdown and team segregation are common measures to mitigate the spread of COVID in the past 21 months. Such measures are essential, but it also means that we have lost more than 50% time in preserving at-risk records, such as those highlighted in the Magnetic Tape Alert Project, an initiative of the UNESCO Information for All Program Working Group on Information Preservation. We do not know how many preservation personnel were affected or lost during this period, but we do know that many of the preservation specialists who still have the skill sets and knowledge in the digitization of very old obsolete magnetic tapes are either in their 60s, 70s, or 80s. And of course, they belong to the high-risk group affected by COVID. All of these result in the extended timeline needed in the digitization of audio and video recordings stored on obsolete magnetic media. 
where much of the world's primary sources of our present knowledge of the culture and linguistic diversity of humankind is kept. Dietrich, uh, as the fourth speaker for this panel and our long-time advocate for the preservation of audiovisual content on magnetic tape, will share more on the global and unprecedented crisis and the race with time to preserve such audio and video recordings. This is the site where you could find more information on the Magnetic Tape Alert Project. With the Magnetic Tape Alert Project, stakeholders, including memory institutions, are now aware of the urgency to rescue our content, cultural content, from being trapped on magnetic media. We thought we would have saved them from loss through digitization. How wrong were we? The success of the Magnetic Tape project, uh, Alert Project could prevent loss of content from magnetic tape media. But it is only the beginning of greater investment needed in digital preservation and the supporting infrastructure for managing large digital files in gigabytes, terabytes, and petabytes. Preservation is thus a continual investment that does not stop at digitization. And for some parts of the world, because of the niche market in digital asset management and preservation system, there is a lack of local support as well. So the diagram on the right shows the technology roadmap for LTO tapes. This is the form of tapes that are used by many audiovisual archives and memory institutions for preserving those digitized audiovisual files. It is great that there is a roadmap to help in preservation planning, but it also brings home the point that the life cycle of such media is very short as compared to the obsolete media like magnetic tapes and films. Hence, continual digital content migration is an undisputed principle of audio and video preservation. And of course, it translates into a continual need for funding. Otherwise, the resources that we have invested in the last 20 years of digitization of magnetic tapes could be wiped out in five to 10 years. It is like a man-made disaster waiting to happen. Finally, we have to start to look at the environmental impact of digital preservation so as to align preservation work to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. There is increasing awareness among the audiovisual community about the impact of digital preservation. It is an area that the preservation subcommittee could work with like-minded partners to promote greater awareness of, if we have the resources. In 2019, I had the opportunity to share on the key issues on the preservation of digital heritage at the second inter-regional conference for the memory of the world, organized by UNESCO Bangkok in Gwangju and Daeju of the Republic of Korea. The issues raised then are still very relevant today. It is heartening to know that more memory institutions realize the need to archive new media and are making progress in web archiving as well as archiving of content on social media platforms. TikTok is the new media that grew in prominence for use in public engagement and sharing of experiences during the COVID pandemic. How are we as a society and global community documenting such content? In the opening remarks given by the UNESCO Deputy Director General, Mr. Xin Chi, at the first UNESCO Virtual Policy Dialogue organized by the Memory of the World Program through the Preservation Subcommittee in, 20, in October last year, he emphasized the need for early intervention in collection to ensure timely documentation and preservation of COVID pandemic experiences. At the presentation by Mr. Wang Xiaochong, 
on China's COVID-19 overall responses. We saw the leadership displayed by the National Archives Administration for China in collecting epidemic prevention and control archives extensively, as well as oral histories. The National Library, National Archives, and National Museum of Singapore have also stepped up on its efforts to document COVID-19 in Singapore, as well as the people's experiences in times of crisis. The Singapore Oral History Centre also innovated its interview collecting processes in response to the pandemic by deploying new technology while being mindful of its impact on preservation standards. Such initiatives is not unique to Singapore. Many oral history organizations and institutions worldwide are also adopting similar approaches. Finally, I would like to dwell a little on the Preservation Subcommittee. The Preservation Subcommittee has its origin in the UNESCO Subcommittee on Technology, which was established by the International Advisory Committee in 1995. In 2019, PERSIS, an initiative established based on the recommendation of the 2012 UNESCO Memory of the World Vancouver Conference, became a permanent core reportable function within the Preservation Subcommittee. As mentioned earlier, the Preservation Subcommittee organized the first virtual policy dialogue in partnership with the Information for All Information Preservation Working Group. And uh, we are pleased to report that the report uh, of the virtual policy dialogue is out on UNESCO website. This is the PERSIS website. Uh, thank you to Claire McGuire for highlighting the second edition of the UNESCO PERSIS guidelines for the selection of digital heritage for long-term preservation. This is a continual work uh, being done by the content and best practices working group under PERSIS. I would also like to show you some past activities of the kind of role that has been undertaken by the subcommittee on technology, the predecessor of preservation subcommittee. The archive medical project, which I understand, received a modest sum of 70,000 US dollars from UNESCO via the predecessor of preservation subcommittee to help in the initial development and launch of archive medical project. We don't like to reminisce about the good old days, but it came to our realization that there is a need for sustained resources for the preservation subcommittee and persist to play a more proactive role, such as those that are listed below so as that we could organize workshops for awareness and capability development, as well as to develop strategic partnerships and to facilitate conversations between memory institutions, industry, and policymakers. Currently, we rely heavily on the graciousness of our institutions to support some of our operational needs, such as the use of an official Zoom account for meetings, and the hosting of PERSIS website. Incidentally, Preservation Subcommittee does not have a web presence. We also find ourselves in this rather odd dilemma. Rather than welcoming all opportunities of collaborations or engagement of memory institutions, stakeholders, industry, and preservation communities, we find ourselves deliberating on how we should be prioritizing our resources, if any? What working groups should we be forming? Whether we should proceed with our participation in key digital preservation events, or should we even be organizing virtual policy dialogues on preservation, digital preservation specifically? There is currently neither a mechanism for us to collect membership dues like ICA and IFLA, nor a framework for us to recruit volunteers. We certainly need to engage like-minded partners and as well as learn more from other IAC subcommittees on how we could look for more resources. So 
with that, uh, I end my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Fang, for that uh, presentation, very helpful. Uh, let's move on then to uh, Mr. Uh, Hiroaki Shimizu, who will be joining us uh, from Japan. As uh, already announced, he is with the Japan uh, Broadcasting Cooperation. Uh, uh, a short explanatory footnote on uh, Mr. Shimizu's participation. Uh, in the event that we have a question uh, posed to him, uh, that question will be translated uh, into Japanese by Ms. Yoko Shimada, who is in the United States, uh, following us uh, online. And similarly, when uh, Mr. Shimuzi uh, answers, that answer will be translated uh, into English uh, for us by uh, Mrs. Shimada. With that, let me call upon Mr. Shimizu. Thank you, Mr. Banda. How... Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. We... We can't hear you. Is this a technical problem on our part or on his part, Mr. Shimizu? Come through if you can. I speak. I... Can you speak? You can. Thank you, Mr. Banda. Uh, hello, everyone. Okay. Uh, my name is Hiroaki Shimizu from Japan. I am honored and grateful that I was invited to this forum attended by experts from all over the world. Please take a look at slide. Today, I would like to talk about the effort of Japan Broadcasting Corporation called NHK in Japan to utilize the documentary heritage stored in a broadcast station for disaster prevention and disaster risk reduction. I will explain how we are passing it down to the younger generation. First, let me introduce NHK. Next slide, please. NHK is a public broadcaster it is not a state-owned broadcaster or a private broadcaster. Next slide, please. I will talk about the archive systems of NHK. Aired programs, video, and audio content are stored as digital files, regardless of the media on which the contents are recorded, such as tapes, films, and digital media. NHK also provides various services to make the archived content available to the public. Next slide, please. On March 11, 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake struck Japan. Over 15,000 people died, and about more than 2,000 people are still missing. Next slide, please. NHK launched a company-wide Oh, before, uh, thank you. NHK launched a company-wide project dedicated to the disaster using broadcast websites, exhibitions, and so on. This project is still going on today. NHK opened the Great East Japan Aspect Digital Library in March 2012, which is the following year of the earthquake. Here are the links for two programs in English. Please take a look later. Today, I would like to share with you the first part of the program, which records this huge disaster. It may be shocking. Could you start the video, please? Video, please. Video, please.
Okay. The first 20 seconds has no sound. Now, let's go back to the presentation, please. Unfortunately, the English version website provides a limited number of content, but the Japanese version website provides a variety of content. Next slide, please. Page six, please. Okay. We have recorded the voices of over 1,000 people. They talk about in what circumstances they experienced the disaster, how they evacuated, and their thoughts and hopes for reconstruction. These voices are variable documentary heritage. Next slide, please. However, there are some challenges. There are cases where some speakers request to delete the content some years later because of their personal reasons. In such cases, we delete the content as requested. Let me show you another challenge we face. There are rare cases in which we are not allowed to upload the content to the websites, despite having gotten the consent of the speakers to broadcast them. That is due to the copyright issues. The copyright laws change with the times so we must continue to pay attention to them. Next, please. NHK created a video timeline chronicling the first 72 hours after the disaster because we thought that we should provide something that evokes memories of those days. The timeline is a unique feature of our digital library. Next slide, please. In operating the timeline, we are always aware that the videos may distress some viewers. Therefore, we put a warning on the videos to ask for special attention, not only to the viewers themselves, but also to the people around them. We also recommend children should watch with their parents or guardians. Next slide, please. Let me introduce another example of our activity. It is a video featuring a local railway that runs along the beautiful coast. As the railway track and some station buildings were destroyed by the earthquake and the tsunami, the service throughout the entire line was suspended. But it resumed eight years later. Next slide, please. This railway company tried something new in the process of reconstruction. For instance, it held enjoyable events, operated a special train on which passengers can learn about the disaster and launched a special tourist train service. As a result, the company successfully attracted many tourists from across the country. NHK broadcast the efforts of the company in news programs regularly. A series of the news footage is available at our library. This railway company was in, finan in financial difficulties before the disaster, but it realized, but it realized, build back better. Next slide, please. From here, I will talk about the main theme of my presentation. In fact, after 10 years, this huge disaster is becoming a past memory. 
our mission is not only to archive the content or make them available to the public, but also to encourage young people with little or no memory of the disaster to watch the content at our library. Next slide, please. Generally in Japan, junior and senior high school students go on a school trip before graduation. They study about the areas they will visit based on the, based on the study theme they choose. Next slide, please. Recently, an increasing number of schools have chosen the areas hit by the Great East Japan earthquake as a school trip destination to run from the disaster. Next slide, please. We regarded the school trip as a good opportunity to deliver the message to the younger generation. So we promoted our library as a school trip study material. Fortunately, we received a positive response from school teachers and travel agencies. We hope the documentary heritage of NHK will make, the, will make the school trips more meaningful for young people, then help prevent future disasters and or reduce disaster risks. Next slide, please. This spring, we held a large event at the museum in Tokyo. We showed some content at the library on large screens and dozens of monitors. Next slide, please. We divided the venue into three sections to display models of the disaster areas and items damaged by the earthquake and tsunami. We also created a section where people can learn about the disaster prevention and the disaster risk reduction. After the event, we added virtual reality video to our library. This video enables viewers to enjoy the exhibit as if, in, as if they are in the venue, even if they are unable to visit or even when the event is over. We hope that the contents created with the state-of-the-art technologies will attract young people. Next slide, please. In Japan, many organizations across the country began to make their documentary heritage available to the public at their digital libraries. The National Diet Library is working to integrate these digital libraries. A challenge for the future would be to integrate the documentary heritage, which is stored in different organizations so that viewers can use them efficiently. Finally, I would like to share my own experience with you. In 1983, a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake occurred and 100 people were killed by the tsunami triggered by the earthquake. I was then a 23 year old postgraduate student. When the earthquake occurred, I was in the ocean to do some research. I remember that the police officer shouted at me from up the levee, hey you, run away, tsunami is coming. I ran away in panic. I still remember the moment. If the police officer had not shouted at me, I might have been swept away by the tsunami. I never, I never imagined I myself would experience such a disaster in my life. NHK on the documentary heritage on natural disasters. We make it available to the public by uh, the digital library and pass it down to the younger generation. We hope we can contribute to the disaster prevention, disaster risk reduction, and help realize build back better. Next slide, please. We believe that this is the mission of NHK, one of the organizations 
who owns valuable documented heritage in Japan. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very Thank much, you very much uh, uh, Mr. Shimizu, for, for that presentation and also for your uh, personal story, which uh, I found very intriguing. Uh, I, I have a question for you. We still have some time for the other presentations. I thought that I should inject this uh, question at this point uh, because you are the only speaker we've had from the media and so this is both exciting and informative uh, for us. What views can you very, very briefly share with us about involving media organizations in our work more decisively, especially given that audiovisual archives may be in abundance in the small libraries located in media organizations. Uh, and this is also a topic that Dietrich uh, Ashula will touch on. That's why it's important that we ask you this question as a, a media uh, professional. Over to you. Um, I hope you understood the question. If not, uh, your translator, your interpreter will step in. はい、え、最初に日本語でお話しさせてください。I'm NHK is working on a variety of initiatives uh, utilizing our archives and we'd like to continue through these activities. え、ですから、あ、将来的に向けては他の組織との連携もま、今後の課題だとは認識しているという状態です。So, uh, we recognize that uh, collaboration with other organizations uh, is a challenge we need to address for the future. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Uh, I suppose that's that. Um, let's move on then to the uh, next uh, presentation, uh, which will be given by Mr. Jonas Palm. Uh, he will be talking about um, uh, sustainable information um, uh, with a focus on nu nuclear waste as disaster prevention. Uh, and for him, uh, even as he makes his presentation, the one issue I want to signal to him and to you uh, is, is that the issue of nuclear waste is very scientific and technical and could possibly put off a large segment of people. And yet, for disaster prevention, it is important to treat the documenting of nuclear waste as a fundamental issue of information for sustainable development. How can we excite or engage people about something so technical as nuclear waste? Over to you. Uh, thank you. How do, we, <coughs> how do we transfer knowledge to future generations? This is probably one of mankind's most fundamental issues through time. It has been the key to our development wherever we have set foot and we have tried a lot of ways to solve this. So far, we have already succeeded to preserve useful, intelligible information for some four to 5,000 years. Is this better? Uh, knowledge have been transferred orally or written as images, as text or as traditions. During the last 70 or so years, a vast amount of nuclear waste has been accumulated. Between 370,000 to 400,000 metric tons. Because of, this extremely dangerous, because of its extremely dangerous properties, information about it and its whereabouts must be secured forever or an extremely long time. In some countries, it has politically been decided to secure the waste for up to 100,000 years, while in reality it may be dangerous for hundreds of thousands of years. How do we succeed information that will last that long? This is the background 
for the OECD NEA, Nuclear Energy Agency, records and knowledge on memory and memory initiative, based on the need to develop an understanding of how to preserve records, knowledge, and memory about radioactive waste across generations and to implement the necessary provisions for this work. All the new ways had been, have been examined. One new approach of importance that was brought into the working procedure was by Professor Cornelius Holthoff at Linnaeus University together with Anders Högberg. The general assumption in the heritage sector is that things from the past are saved for the future. This is being debated in a recent book uh, edited by these guys uh, titled Cultural Heritage and the Future. One key question is what cultural heritage do we pass on to what use? It is stated that there is a need for future literacy. The work of the RKM initiative was developed too much to, along these ideas. About 100,000 years ago, mankind started to migrate from the African continent. Cave paintings, as the ones in Altamira in Spain, were made 36,000 years ago. The most recent ice age ended 14,000 years ago, and the pyramids of Giza, Egypt, were built 4,500 years ago. We now have radioactive waste, which will be dangerous forever, which is an equally long period of time and beyond. And we want to inform future generations about this. The issue of other hazardous waste fits very well within this concept. But in this context, we will focus on the nuclear waste. Until the 20th century, Preservation of information was a question of using or producing durable materials as media, like, for example, stones, clay tablets, parchment, paper, and later, later to some extent, photographic procedures. Preserving information relied on collecting. With modern media, both analog and digital, we have to rely on constant attention and activities to keep information long-term accessible. There is no single mechanism or technique that by itself is likely to preserve RKM over millennia. Rather, an integrated set of mechanisms and techniques, technical, administrative, and societal, are needed to support one another. As reality changes, the overall strategy will be to transfer the same message on and on and on in new forms and formats and ways. The future will present major challenges. Language change, languages change, imagery changes, geographical changes, climate changes, the, uh, technological changes, and cultural changes. And these can only be counteracted with multiple strategies. An historic example on how information can survive by transfer from one culture to the next and still to another and one while well, one and back is how antique Greek texts survived. These dominated the Mediterranean world around 500 BC. It was literature, research, scientific documents. Some of these were translated into Latin as the Roman Empire conquered the Mediterranean. Latin texts uh, include uh, Latin text, including the translations from Greek, were later translated into Syriac and Arabic as the knowledge and interest of these texts spread. The cultural situation in Europe changed as Christianity became hostile against science at a time when Islamic researchers praised God for the knowledge. In the 390s, St. Augustine of Hippo, a bishop, uh, and viewed as one of the major church fathers of the Western Christianity, wrote in his confessions, Men want to know for the sake of knowing, though the knowledge is of no value to them. The Arabs noted that once the people in former Rome adopted Christianity, they were ended up in, a, in, a, in an electrical, intellectual backwaters. Thanks to the interest in Rome, back. Thanks to the interest in Roman and Greek literature, philosophy, and science within the Islamic world. A lot of this survived. It eventually became interesting again for Europeans during the Renaissance, which promoted the discovery of classical knowledge. It is necessary to collect and structure what we decide 
is essential information about the properties and the whereabouts of the nuclear waste repositories. We must inform why it's important to transfer this information further on, and we must learn not to forget. The measures will be intelligible through the ages with proper measures taken repeatedly to update the information. The two major building blocks in the RKNM work are the set of essential records and the key information files, short SER and KIF or KIF. A set of essential records is designed to be a compilation of actual records selected because they could be, would be required for future generations and to understand the repository system and its performance and to assist them to make informed decisions. A key information file is designed to be a single short document produced in a standard format with the aim of allowing society to understand the nature and intent of, the of a repository and thus to reduce the likelihood of unnecessary human intrusion. It should be open, openly available and ultimately be widely distributed. GIF documents are already in the making when, uh, by, among others, the Swedish Nuclear Fuel and Waste Management and the French National Radioactive Waste Management Agency, ANDRA. The RKNM deliveries can be found to be downloaded on the OECD website as well as from the OECD Nuclear A Energy Agency website. And you can just search on these words, actually. The RKNM strategic ways, mechanisms we call them, are shown here. The heritage mechanisms are art, culture and education, memory institutions, records or archives, markers and time capsules. The societal ways are knowledge management, national legal framework and oversight. Oversight meaning control over this, this place, these places. These mechanisms are generally national. They are explained in depth in the RKMN deliverables. Thus, to get RKNM to function in a long perspective, it's essential to involve international mechanisms. In this context, an international mechanism is defined as a mechanism for RKNM preservation that has, that has international influence, scope, or support, and is based on international cooperation. An international mechanism can be governmental, consisting of entities or activities that are based on mutual agreements between a number of national governments or non-governmental consisting of entities and activities that bring together non-governmental, private, or commercial organizations. One such international mechanism is UNESCO. And within UNESCO is the Member of the World Program. This program started in 1992, and its mission is to facilitate preservation, to assist universal access, and to increase awareness worldwide of the existence and significance of documentary heritage just what RKMN is aiming at, focused on radioactive waste. Memory World is an international mechanism which has registered past but also recent heritage. To be involved in documentation of nuclear waste is a responsibility which would be an important asset in the multi-mechanism strategy, fitting with the principles of UNESCO and the task of Memory of the World program. Already uh, one item related to nuclear power was inscribed in 2017, the documentary heritage related to the accident at Chernobyl, regarding the Chernobyl accident in 1986. This together with, for example, the RKNM information package will form an important legacy for future generations. In the book, the UNESCO member of the World Program, Lothar Jordan, chair of the Subcommittee of Education and Research, which you have seen here, uh, and I wrote an article titled, How to Make Information on Nuclear Waste Sustainable, the case for the participation of the UNESCO Member of the World Program. Ending the conclusion, we wrote, today, Member of the World Program reacts to documents that already exist or are lost. In the registers, they are discussed in terms of the outstanding significance and qualification to be inscribed in a listing of heritage that earns and requires all efforts to make it sustainable. But in the case of sustainable documentation on nuclear waste, member of the world, sorry, and others would take part in creating something new that in the end should have outstanding significance. We proposed to reflect on what is 
what this means for the concept of heritage. If one includes the documentation on nuclear waste, heritage would not be something from the past, which is thought to be kept for the future. It would be, too, something constructed for the far future, motivated by a responsibility that sees an irrefutable and urgent need for constructing memory. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Palm, for that uh, uh, presentation. Um, uh, you need to answer my question, um, which I posed early on. So uh, if you can, uh, I'll be very happy. But in the meantime, uh, let's move on to uh, Mr. Diedrich Schuller, who is going to share information with us on the magnetic tape alert project that he's been involved with for quite some time now. And uh, he is passionate about this particular project. Over to you, Mr. Schuller. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to present uh, the, uh, the magnetic tape alert project as it stands. This is a project which has been started a couple of years ago. Yes, thank you. Uh, and it is not immediately uh, in the center of this, of, of, of this conference here because it does not uh, talk about a disaster um, uh, by climatic change or, or anything else. However, it is a management problem, as you will, as we will see. And if we don't cope with these problems, it will be a disaster, but not a climatic one, but a management disaster. So, having said this, let me introduce the. Uh, the problem, um, the, uh, and I start with the content of, uh, the, of the documents which I will be talking about. Uh, support and documentation of cultural and linguistic uh, diversity of humankind is undoubtedly a central mission of UNESCO. And because today's knowledge of uh, cultural and linguistic diversity is predominantly based on audio and video documents that has been produced since the 1950s, and therefore it becomes a strong uh, technical and preservational um, issue. Uh, what, what are we talking about? We are talking about the documents proper for spoken language for played music, for dance, for drama, for ritual, oral history, and that specifically for orally transmitted cultures. These uh, specificities can only be captured uh, by audio and video re recordings and not by, text, by any texts uh, uh, by, by textual presentations. Uh, likewise, also these documents are, um, uh, uh, are documents of the intangible heritage, which is another important uh, aim of UNESCO. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Now, all uh, audiovisual documents except photographs are machine-readable documents, and therefore it is obvious that uh, access requires replay equipment in operable condition. This is a trivial statement, but the availability of uh, operable um, machinery uh, is threatened by the obsolescence through technical progress. This has yesterday very, um, uh, very well described uh, by Natasha Militz-Freiling. Uh, 
to minimize now the risks of obsolescence, and obsolescence can be hardware and software, the standard preservation pro uh, uh, procedure for audio, video, and more recently also for film is the transfer of contents, uh, be they analog or digital in the originals, into digital repositories, the safeguarding of those contents by ongoing lossless migration from one preservation platform to the next, and of course, analog contents have uh, to be digitized first. These principles have already de uh, been discussed in the uh, very late 1980s in the course of a meeting of a predecessor of the Preservation Committee uh, in, uh, with uh, manufacturers. And from that on, the discussion was very strongly uh, pro uh, proceeding. So we had the first standards uh, uh, in digital preservation uh, of this of audiovisual documents already uh, in uh, the mid 1990s. Okay, I'm sorry, it, it, it does not work. <laughs> okay. Now, what is the specific threat to uh, to CLD documents? If I may abbreviate it like that. The uh, magnetic tape was the dominant recording technology for audio and video from the 1950s onwards until around uh, 1919 to uh, 2000. It was uh, superseded by computer technology, by, or we call it IT technology since the uh, mid 1990s for audio, uh, around 2000 for video, and more uh, recently also uh, for film. Today, or at least uh, since 10 years already, all magnetic tape uh, recording formats, analog and digital audio and video are fully obsolete. So replay equipment, spare parts, and technology skills are fading. We have heard this from several interventions uh, in these, in these two, the, uh, two days already. Now, uh, it is very clear that transfer of originals to digital repositories will end within a couple of years, often quoted is the magic year uh, 2025. This does not mean that 2025 is an absolute full stop, but as the amount of replay equipment is getting less and less, the, it's getting more complicated and more expensive to have these uh, not yet transferred and anal uh, analog and digital tapes uh, be transferred to digital repository. Uh, we are now uh, having an organizational problem or a management problem, which is actually the core of, of, this, uh, of this project. Uh, broadcast and national audiovisual archives they have been aware of the problem since around 2000 and have very well prepared for the, for the transfer of their contents. And uh, partly they, uh, the job is done, other par parts are still waiting, but generally uh, they are financed or at least envisaged that they must uh, be transferred, and so the danger that they get lost is actually minimal. However, uh, a great part of those uh, magnetic tapes we are talking about, about the tapes of cultural and linguistic diversity, they are typically outside archival custodies. They are not held in libraries, they are not held in, in archives, they have been created by research institutions or by cultural institutions, uh, and they have done it for study the contents, 
not to build up an archive or not with the intention actually uh, to preserve them for eternity. Uh, also, they regret uh, that, that they have no budgets for that. So this is, this is, this is the problem uh, which we are facing. Uh, so uh, they are notoriously underfunded and there is a, a wide lack of equipment, preservation skills, and possibly also of awareness in some uh, cases. Yeah. Now, uh, this triggered the magnetic tape alert project, which was started a couple of years ago, or prepared a couple of years uh, ago, uh, under the umbrella of IFAP, the Information for All program, in cooperation with uh, YASA, and they joined forces to explore the dimension of the problem. The dimension of the problem was, and still is, unfortunately, uh, un, uh, unclear. Um, in order to keep uh, the burden of filling in questionnaires uh, low, uh, only magnetic tape collection have been searched for, and emphasis was on yet uh, undigitized uh, holdings, those who are still sitting on their original carriers. The principal tool uh, was a questionnaire in all six uh, UN languages, which was open from July uh, 19 to end of May 2020, and the results are published uh, by YASA, uh, and there is the link, the, you'll find the link also on the YASA web, uh, web page, uh, and I strongly recommend uh, you look into that. Now, what is the summary of the report? This is a 60-page report, and I only give you one page of that. Uh, there were 411 submissions from uh, 76 countries, 4.4 million audio, 4.1 million video items. The most common formats were open reel audio, compact cassette audio, video VHS, and Betamax. This was uh, uh, foreseeable. It was encouraged encouraging, it is encouraging, that uh, generally the awareness of the problem is evident. However, only from those who have answered. We do not know whether those who have not answered are aware of the problem or are not even aware and therefore have not answered. It is also not a surprise that uh, we have uh, a uh, we have financial problems, we have lack of equipment and skills. Many institutions ask for, uh, for training courses and uh, also for uh, assistance in the work. Now, uh, generally also only parts of the holdings are safeguarded and often uh, only plans uh, for the preservation uh, exist. Surprising uh, was the very uneven global response. Uh, there was a concentration on North America and Europe, but uh, other regions are very underrepresented. It, it is obvious that a proactive research is needed to find uh, these unorganized, hidden, and scattered collections that are outside memory institutions. So it's a management, it is actually a management uh, uh, problem and a, a problem how archives and libraries can reach out uh, for those who are not yet in their community. Now, uh, they, I can keep the recommendations of the report uh, fa fairly short. Uh, in, in it, it strongly recommends national and regional uh, cooperation. And from my personal uh, experience, I've been to several uh, missions uh, in uh, various parts of the world. Uh, 
I can only say that generally the solution uh, of 80% of the problems uh, are within the country. No experts need to be important if they cooperate. Cooperation on the local or national uh, level, however, is yet not the daily experience because institutions have a natural, perhaps, tendency uh, to uh, competition. Uh, and this, is, this really kills uh, the, uh, uh, a, a good progress in this situation. Uh, awareness raising and capacity building is uh, a very Im important, and I see that this is a key element for UNESCO, uh, specifically uh, for memory of the world and, and its preservation uh, uh, subcommittee. Uh, subcommittee. In uh, summarizing, let me uh, say that um, it is, uh, we need concerted actions by uh, national organization to complete, to get a better and more complete uh, picture of, this, of the situation. Uh, ideally, all member states should establish national body work bodies, working group, committees, whatever they want, uh, want to call it. Uh, and important is that governmental top-down processes are complemented by NGO uh, or academic interests that, uh, that look into the matter from bottom up because they have the access and the interest in the content, not so much in the uh, structure of the organization. And these, uh, these should uh, be charged to uh, produce national surve surveys which would uh, provide a, um, a realistic uh, a picture of the quantitative uh, dimension of the, of the problem, which we do not know and which is varying a lot from country uh, to uh, country. Of course, an overlook on the situation is not yet a solution but it is an indispensable a prerequisite for the planning and, organize, and organizing uh, of successful uh, preservation, both uh, for the member states as well as for uh, UNESCO. I'm closing with a warning. Um, magnetic tapes will be inaccessible within a couple of years. We will sit on millions of well-preserved carriers, but we will not have the possibility to listen to them or to you, their, their context. And these tapes, and now I come back to the content, uh, these tapes are the sources for thousands of texts and analysis uh, on the cultural and linguistic diversity of humanity. And if we miss to safeguard these uh, originals, we would be able to read the text about the languages, the rituals, the dances, the music, etc. But we would not be able to listen to the original sounds and to the optical impression which the videotape uh, provide. I find this an unbearable uh, thought and it, that must be prevented. Please read uh, the, the report. It's a 60-page report. It is informative and inspiring and do go home and produce your uh, national survey of the yet un undiscovered uh, sources for cultural and linguistic diversity. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schuler. I think all the uh, presenters have done an excellent job of um, um, sticking to time. We have some 10 minutes uh, for questions. I do not see uh, any particularly burning questions uh, in the chat, but I do have a question which I posed to you, uh, Mr. Palm, um, uh, uh, you know, earlier on. Perhaps uh, you would care to answer it now. How can we excite or engage people about something so technical as nuclear waste? It actually is already working <laughs> in uh, Holland. In the southwest of Holland, they have uh, built a radioactive waste depository. Uh, and that uh, a sort of radioactive afal behandlung, high level radioactive treatment in the story build and storage building above ground, which will be there for 100 years. And uh, apart from storage of radioactive waste, the repository houses museum collections not currently on display. And it has become a center for cultural activities where art, stories, and cultural heritage helps preserve knowledge and memory in order to make the waste management concept more visible and understandable. Furthermore, the buildings will be repainted over time in different and fading colors, which will represent the radioactive decay in its, uh, its, 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 it is housing. The art concept has been further developed making use of the periodical incidence of natural light, like probably one of the most fundamental rituals of mankind. This is an example of how the implementation of artistic and cultural mechanisms can add value to something, the waste, that by definition has no value, and in the process keep memory alive. Thank you very much uh, for that. There's a question here for Mr. Schuler about Brazilian institutions. Uh, do you think uh, that ABPA, I don't know what uh, you know, that stands for, uh, who answered the report um, uh, is an active player in preservation? I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not particularly um, knowing the uh, Brazilian situation, also I've been there once, uh, and I do not know the institution uh, the, the, question, the question is about. Uh, uh, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I, so I cannot, I cannot uh, answer, the, answer that question. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, that's, I think, uh, good enough. We've got a question from amongst uh, one of uh, our panelists here, in fact, another one. Uh, let's uh, hand it over to uh, uh, Papa Moma Diop. Merci. Thank you very much indeed. I have a couple of questions, in fact. My first question has to do with issues of conservation uh, of magnetic tapes, microfilms uh, in particular, and also um, identic photography uh, supports. And this is an issue that we have encountered rather frequently in Africa. The uh, materials are not uh, obsolete. Nevertheless, we do need the adequate equipment to uh, uh, read these uh, sources, especially for microfilms that are now attacked by a, a variety of agents. And it is the same thing for um, photography. And I would like to ask the panelists whether there are any technical or technological solutions that are effective and could be shared to perhaps not recover everything that has been lost, but to conserve what we still have. That is my first question. The second question, I've heard about obsolescence, soft obsolescence and hard obsolescence. Now, to me, this is a very serious disaster indeed. And I think that uh, obsolescence of equipment, or whether soft or hard, 
could be uh, classified as a, a disaster for documentary heritage. And just to give you one example, remember the floppy disks. I have a number of them. I uh, have both formats, in fact, but I can't use them anymore. I can't read them. And I have no idea whether they have even deteriorated. And this, again, is a massive loss. So my question would be, technically, or from the technological point of view, are there any solutions to put an end sustainably to this type of disaster? Thank you. Let's, let's uh, bring in uh, um, Lota Jordan uh, for the final question, and then I'll, uh, I'll hand over to uh, the panelists. Yes, thank you, Fexen. First of all, thanks to all the presenters, which gave me a very good insight into the work of this preservation subcommittee since he is. Uh, but I want to come back to a question by Fexen Bender. He asked, how can the presentations this afternoon fit into the work for the strategic frame you develop? And I cannot speak for the presenters. I just want to come back to Jonas Palm as a subcommittee in education research. Uh, since five years was open open to your proposals and reflections. My proposal is concerning the strategic frame which has priority one to four to open a door to the future because the Sendai framework couldn't cover all aspects. When UNESCO was founded, nobody thought of the internet. And later we had sector communication information. So a door must always be open to the future. And I propose right away that uh, in addition to priority one and four, there is a small supplement called perhaps new challenges and new reactions, which may include something like nuclear waste. So this is, opens the door to each convention, each very good framework like Sendai cannot cover the, the questions of the future, but we are now on the brink to questions of the future. And they are not quite in the framework, but they are on the line of the framework. So that's my proposal on a strategic aspect, add a small chapter, uh, supp call it supplement or as you like it, new challenges and new uh, reactions. Uh, and things like a proposal of Jonas could be put in there. We can discuss it further. So this is a question I try to help to give an answer on your question, Faxon. So let me start with uh, Diedrich. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me start. I mean, Jonas has... Microphone, please. Yeah, my, yeah. Uh, audio visual preservation is clear. It is published, yeah. There is no principal problem. There are some questions open, nothing is 100%. But the answer, the International Association of Sound and Audio Visual Archives has issued four standards, a general one, one for audio, uh, uh, one for audio digitization, one for video digitization, and one, and I was the author of that, uh, of, the, of keeping the original carriers as long as possible. But uh, we, in, in the 1980s, we were, uh, there was the fashion of fears that the ta tapes uh, will dissolve. This does not happen. 80% uh, 80, uh, 80 may survive, but it is from, a, from an economic point of view, totally unrealistic to think that you, that in 10 years time, or let's say 15 years time from now, you are able to play a videotape or an audio tape, uh, unless for small um, uh, entrepreneurs who have kept 10 machines and uh, and then and and uh, and so they have a little reservoir uh, to uh, to do something. But this will be very expensive. So don't miss, don't miss the transition of uh, carrier-based uh, preservation, which is of course the standard for text documents, yeah, uh, okay. to uh, to content-based. Uh, 
uh, uh, files, convert the content into files and keep the files uh, alive by continuous, uh, by continuous uh, adaptation to software and hardware, which you normally don't even notice. And this is today, it is payable. Uh, it is uh, in, the, in the order of a few cents uh, per, uh, per gigabyte and year. But it costs something. We yeah? don't have much and time, Mr. Schur. Yeah, we don't I have, have much to time. stop here, yeah, but uh, yeah, yes, yes, because uh, this, is, this is one of my lectures. But I <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so, so, sorry. So, uh, uh, Mr. Palm, very, very quickly, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry. Qu quickly answer to, to Papa. There are two ISO standards that you should get hold on. One is 18902, and the other is 18934. And that is probably the most useful for you. It's archival media, archival archives of mixed media and uh, multiple media archive storage environments. And this is working out of uh, useful uh, recommendations for uh, archives who has not the top-notch facilities for storing photographs. Example, for example, the, uh, the uh, microfilm that you mentioned, they are acetate films, most likely. And they, they de really deteriorate in hot climate and so. So try to get hold of this. I can send you the uh, information about this. Okay. Thank you. So on that note, um, I would like to conclude uh, this particular session. It's uh, many thanks to all the uh, speakers and all those who have made contributions uh, um, to the discussion. Uh, over to Sumi. Thank you indeed on my behalf as well to all of the speakers for those presentations and contributions. Before we do wrap up, I would like to invite for some final closing words here to the stage, Mr. Yussi Nurteva. He's a National Archivist of Finland, and he is a Vice Chair of the International Advisory Committee as well. So he will provide us with some closing words. Mr. Nurteva, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. When I was listening to this session at the beginning and the speech of Dr. Faxon Banda, I think that he said very much about the overview of this program and also the forward looks for this program. I must congratulate the Secretariat for the work that has been done. I think that we are in a position that the program is really running now. We have very much that has been happening. And uh, I was very glad also that I heard that we are having 700 registered participants in this forum. That is a huge number and of course I understand that everybody is not listening to every presentation, but many people are listening to some of the presentations and they pick the information that is included in them. I have participated in this program for many years and I must say that I face one problem in these discussions. We have so much information. We have so many initiatives that have been taken that I, I think that I'm almost exhausted about all what I have heard. And I believe that it's the same situation for many others. How can we pick the information that is important for us? Because we are different even though we have our common principles and professional practices, but our resources are different, our situations are different, our staff amount is different, and that means that we have to be very wise and selective also when we are building up the capacities that we need in each case. I think that it is also important that for us to remember the very basics the archival documentary heritage, especially that we have in our repositories, has not come from the sky. Our holdings are a result of our professional work that we have concluded following the established national and international practices of appraisal. None of us has resources to preserve everything. 
that once has been created. We have to be selective and pick the part of the heritage that according to our best understanding will be birth to preserve. That is what we also do and what has been done by our predecessors. Even though the principles may vary, but they have also done their best to preserve the documentary heritage that is representative for the society. I think that it is our ethical responsibility also to guarantee that the information, the archives, documents that we preserve is representative. It must give an authentic, balanced and many-sided picture of our societies, not forgetting the groups that easily are left in the margin. Understanding of our history society and values is based on the information we preserve and that we make available for the users, researchers, decision makers and citizens. Unfortunately, we know that these principles are not always respected. We know that limiting the use of archives and in some cases even eradication of information leads at worst to false interpretation of history. In some cases, those persons who have dared to stand up to protect the endangered history heritage have done so risking their health and even lives. I want to mention today Lokman Slim from Beirut, who has been working in the Human Rights Working Group of the ICA. Today, we were supposed to have the meeting of the Human Rights Working Group. We were informed that he was found shot to his dead from his car. We also know that he had been working with his wife, Monica Borgman, in Beirut to collect information about the 70,000 persons who had died or disappeared during the Lebanese civil war. Luckily, this information had been digitized and preserved also in Finland as a safe haven for this kind of materials. That was a huge work that we did together with the Finnish National Archives staff working in Beirut together with the colleagues from Lebanon. We have also been working with the materials as a safe haven, those materials from the time of the civil war. We know that much has been destroyed also intentionally. We had more than 40 volunteers working to take digital copies with their mobile phones and photograph with cameras. And also those persons did it with the high risk. Many of them lost their lives. These are, of course, ultimate situations in our profession as custodians of the documentary cultural heritage. Luckily, the materials I mentioned have now been digitally copied and they are available. Also, thanks to the Safe Heavens work that has been based on the principles of the paragraph 5.4 of the recommendation adopted by the UNESCO General Assembly in 2015, and that has been mentioned by ICA President David Fricker yesterday, and by some others also. Dear participants, during the last decades, we have seen a growing number of natural catastrophes caused in many cases by consequences of the climate change. We have also been seen destruction caused by armed conflicts which seem to be ever more destructive. We have seen negligence, indifference, and lack of interest towards the cultural heritage that we as professionals stand for. Unfortunately, in many cases, the risks and disasters are man-made, directly or indirectly. They are the work of the humankind, all of us. 
following the discussions during the two days, we have understood that documentary cultural heritage is not an island isolated from the daily life of human societies and the nature around us. It is good to ventilate the thoughts we have, but most important and necessary is to find the ways to tackle the problems we have detected. We have followed regional and national overviews from all continents, as well as special cases like that one, one about documentary heritage in Curaçao, presented by His Excellency Minister Ornelio Martina at the beginning of the first day. Today, we are speaking about multitasking situations due to the cascading effects of the disaster situations. We understand that risk management of documentary heritage needs to be part of the general preparedness of the societies to avoid and manage the threats and disasters caused by climate change, natural catastrophes, armed conflicts, as well as social inequality and instability. The pilot survey of the UNESCO and the Japanese funds in trust showed that surprisingly, 40 out of the 63 organizations who participated in the survey did not have an emergency management plan. Today, we also heard about the case in Pakistan and the need to have inventories of the cultural heritage. This is something that we really need to work on in the future. Early recognition of risks for the documentary cultural heritage is essential in building up capacities to react quickly in the various situations through global actions. This is a responsibility not only of all the UNESCO member states, but especially of the international organizations representing the archives, libraries, museums, and other actors in the field of cultural heritage. I am very glad that the presentations of the professional organizations we heard at this forum were very good. This shows that they have the strength in the professional community and they really do shed light and hope for the future. Dear colleagues, open access to documentary heritage is as an essential part of freedom of information, understanding of the history, values and principles of the societies based on the rule of law. Cooperation between the keepers of the local and global documentary heritage supports sustainability, stability and equality in the societies and globally. Possibilities to share the documentary heritage in digital form should be used systematically in safeguarding cultural heritage as well as in keeping the born digital records and making them available for all. Strengthening our determination to safeguard endangered cultural heritage of all peoples against its destruction and illicit trafficking which was the message of the international conference that was held under the auspices of UNESCO in December 2016 in the United Arab Emirates, together with France. However, only a few concrete steps have so far been taken in building up a global network of safe heavens. The concrete work in creating safe heavens for documented heritage at risk needs to be strengthened. We must be aware that safe heavens are also a tool in implementing the goals set by the 1954 Hague Convention and its second protocol adopted in March 1999 for the protection of cultural protecting property in the event of armed conflict. We are also glad and grateful for the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2347 on March 2017, which was a milestone in protection of cultural heritage. In that decision, the Security Council deplored the unlawful destruction of cultural heritage, religious sites and artifacts, 
and the smuggling of cultural property by terrorist organizations during armed conflict, affirming that such attacks might constitute a war crime and must be brought to justice. One issue that has been raised in this forum is repatriation of colonial time documents to the countries of origin. In many cases, it is not easy to define the owner of these documents. They are in many cases part of a shared cultural heritage belonging to two or more states. The issue is disputed, the issue of all disputed documentary heritage was raised up in a survey conducted by Leopold Auer as early as in 1997-98 for the UNESCO and the International Council on Archives. The survey registered a number of claims for repatriation. Unfortunately, I lost the voice here. <laughs> this is off. It should. Okay, now it's on. Yes, unfortunately, the survey registered the number of cases, but very little was done after the survey of Dr. Auer. It may also be mentioned that the new survey was conducted in 2019 by the Liverpool University Centre for Archival Studies on behalf of the ICA's expert group on shared archival heritage. A first step in many of these cases of disputed documentary heritage is to enhance digitalization of the displaced documentary heritage in order to make it available for all parties and audiences. Dear colleagues, I want to thank you all for participating in this second global policy forum. I find that it has been very useful opportunity to open the discussions and to look at the situation where we are in preserving the documentary heritage. We have learned a lot and I want to thank you all, especially the Secretariat for the work you have done and the Japanese foundations for their generous support. Thank you and be safe. Thank you, Mr. Nortiva, for those very prescient and fitting closing remarks. This does indeed bring to an end this second World uh, Forum. And it has been wonderful to have all of you with us, especially all of you joining us on our Zoom webinar who have been staying with us in large number through the course of yesterday and today. So thank you again for your participation and your engagement. I would like to thank also all of our speakers and presenters who have done a wonderful job, put a lot of work into the presentations and shared so much detail that has been much appreciated by all of the participants as well. That has brought incredible detail, as I said, and also a foundation for the path forward. Uh, so thank you for your presentations. I would also like to extend my thanks to Mr. Faxon Banda and the Secretariat, including Kenji Tamura and the entire UNESCO Memory of the World team, all of the people here from Rana and Anna, Veronica and Mariama who have worked tirelessly and with much precision to ensure that this program has been able to go on as it has. Of course, we would have liked, as I said in the beginning, to invite a big room of people together uh, to discuss this topic. It wasn't possible, but still we got a fruitful discussion. So thank you for all of that organization. And I would like to add my thoughts, as we heard from Mr. Nurateva, my thanks to the Japanese government, especially the Ministration of, uh, Ministry excuse me, of educa Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology for their generous support of this event. And we have said a few times, thank you to the interpreters for leading us through these past two days. It is not an easy job, and you've done a wonderful job, so thank you. <laughs> the path has now been paved. We've laid the foundation here, and it is now about moving forward. So one way that is possible, the strategic framework that Mr. Banda presented this morning at the very start of day two will be on the website, the Memory of the World website, after the conclusion of this a global policy forum. 
The Secretariat asks that you, all of you who have taken part, engage with this framework, send your comments, your contributions to help make this an action plan that is built upon a broad coalition of stakeholders working in memory institutions, in partner institutions, uh, in volunteer groups, and so on. Then it can be indeed put into action. So that is one key action you can take to move forward with the strategic framework. So thank all of you uh, again to uh, all of our presenters, our participants for upholding, preserving, and promoting our documentary heritage. And we hope to see you soon at a future forum and look forward to engaging and connecting. Thank you.